Welcome back to another edition of the Podcast. Yes, we like to call it Rich Tag. Feel good. Fake it till you make it. Rich Blair. Woo! Woo! Loose to be football, but 512 Friday edition of the Rodcast featuring my man Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. I'll introduce my co host in just a second momentarily. Uh, we got a lot to get into on the show. Stephen Jones. Finally speaking to the media about the Cowboys, their plans and free agency, the Dak Prescott extension, uh, what they think about the running back position. We got lots of Stephen Jones audio for you. We'll get to that coming up a little bit later on the show when we talk Cowboys. Speaking of the Cowboys, they didn't make another move. Uh, they re-signed one of their own, and we know uh, they like their guys. We like our guys. That's what the guy boys always say. Uh, so one of their guys uh, gets an extension, a, a one-year rental, if you will, for the Cowboys. But I think it's really important. So we'll talk about that once again, building that defense. The Texans make an unexpected move. Not really sure what I think about it yet. They extend Joe Mixon. They didn't have to. They brought him in via a trade from Cincinnati. Uh, but they like him so much, they've extended him in a three-year deal. We'll talk about that. Uh, with the Houston Texans a little bit later on. Wimby is coming to town. Uh, Wimby Yama, one of the great spectacles in all of sports, is coming to the ATX to play in the mood. My man Patrick is the biggest Spurs fan I know, so we'll talk to him about that. I'm sure he's excited. Maybe he's not excited about that. Some Spurs fans don't like that the Spurs are playing in Austin. They think it may be a uh, a bad omen, maybe foreshadowing something bad for Spurs fans. We'll get into that. We'll talk about it, all of that, and more before we do. Let's introduce you to the rest of the crew. Uh, he's the idealionaire, one of the hardest working members of the ARN family. He's got a hustle spirit, period. We don't know what he's paid. We just know he's underpaid. He's a uh, a hustle man of many talents. Ain't no 401k for this hustler, folks. Uh, he is my he is my friend, my neighbor, but also my co-host is Patrick Davis, y'all, the real MVP. What's going on, brother? How are you? I'm doing good, man. Had a good time yesterday. Went down and partook in probably as much as South by as all partake in. There you I go. Did. I went to one show, so that was it. I went to one thing. So be the one of it. show, just one. But it was a lot of fun. I ran into some people that listened to the show, and they were saying nice things. And, nice. And, uh, there you go. Of course, somehow was backstage and then on stage and all things that I was not supposed to be doing that people hey, were on stage. I was, but it was a tribute to another person. So it was all it was all in good fun, but it was a lot of fun out there. That's great. Uh, That's seeing great. Some, some seeing some old friends. So a lot of fun yesterday. Gonna have some fun today on the show because my co-host is a proud alumni of DBU. He's got more papers than Dunder Mifflin and watches more film than Siskel and Ebert. He is the new rod father of Austin Sports Radio. Mr. Rod Babers. I appreciate the intro as always. Uh, you are still MVP, but the most important part of the show, uh, that is the audience, the listeners, the people. Uh, so you can always hit us up on the text line, 512-447-3776. We want to hear from you. Your, your participation uh, makes the show just that much better. You also can hit us up via Twitter. My man Patrick at it Patrick Davis. I'm at Rod Babers in the Twitterverse. Uh, we'll have your big fat poll of the day coming up at 645 for your big fat poll of the day. Also, uh, we didn't get into this in the intro, but uh, there's some Aaron Rodgers, some weird Aaron Rodgers news to get to. It's strange. Uh, and it seems like most of the news coming out about Aaron Rodgers these days is a bit strange. Uh, yeah, but there is some really weird uh, Aaron Rodgers news that we'll get to. The, the latest was that he was being considered for the vice presidential uh, ticket. Uh, on the vice presidential nomination of our of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, you know, we know that, you know, there's some, uh, I would say some um, alignment in some of their views. <laughs> um, so that was actually a real report that came out earlier this week and we laughed at it. But now uh, there's another uh, issue, uh, potential controversy brewing with Aaron Rodgers. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on the show. Matter of fact, it's C CNN is, is talking about this thing. And maybe when you are mentioned as a vice presidential candidate, that's when uh, all the, uh, the dirt starts coming up. People start digging up dirt on you. Well, uh, they're digging up some dirt on Aaron Rodgers already. So we'll talk about that. I will also get into some Texas football discussion. We are five days away from the start of spring football. Uh, so we'll talk some spring football and we go behind the burnt orange curtain. There are some questions I think Longhorn fans have at every position pretty much. Uh, different questions and uh, different levels of concern. We'll talk about that and we go behind the burnt orange curtain a little bit. We'll also talk about the uh, New Look Denver Broncos, which apparently they like the burnt orange. They got their own brand of orange. They like burnt orange up there too because they got a lot of Longhorns representing. I'll tell you what the uh, the commonality is between all those 
uh, new Denver Broncos who are also lifetime Longhorns because they have five of them now on the roster. I'll tell you something I think they all have in common. We'll get into that and we go behind the burnt orange curtain. We got your horn headlines. So Patrick will get us informed and educated on all the top stories of the day. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that coming up a little bit later on. Uh, but Patrick, uh, real quick, your thoughts on Wimby coming to town, Wimby coming to Austin. Uh, the Spurs going to play in the mood. Actually going to play against the Denver Nuggets. That should be, I don't know if it's going to be a good game, but it gives you a lot to watch. If you are you get to a see, Wimby fan, you get to see some of the best basketball players on the planet. You get to see Wimby versus Jokic. There you go. Like that that matchup like, there in itself is worth, worth the price, the price of admission. Yes. You yes. see yes. Wimby yes. versus Jokic. Uh, it was fun. So the event I was at yesterday was down to Auditorium Shores. It was a steamboat reunion. It was a lot of fun. But one of the sponsors of it was the Spurs, and they were raising money for playing. Uh -huh. yeah. So I was backstage, and then all of a sudden, Kelton Johnson and Mamu pull up. And hey, they're rocking out backstage nice. before they go off and gave out some T-shirts. But I'm like, hey, Spurs are here. Uh, so it's cool. I, I think that in reality, this is a Spurs. I understand the fear of Spurs fans that uh that they might oh, move yeah. the franchise. I understand that fear. I, I don't want them to move it either. I know there are people in Austin who would love to have the Spurs come to Austin. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of them. I'm I'm all for it being in San Antonio. It's not a long drive. I've made it hundreds of times uh down to the <laughs> down to see the Spurs over the years. So uh, I'm fine with that. I don't think that's the deal. I think they understand that they want to expand in the Austin market. They yeah. want to have a fan base here. And so they're trying to make that expansion. They're trying to connect with the Austin fan base. And you can do that by playing at the Moody. They don't want to be at the Moody all full time. They would have to build their own arena here because the Moody's too small for an NBA franchise. So they would want a bigger arena, which I don't know how much the city of Austin would want to fund a new arena in Austin. That would probably be on the south side of Austin, you would assume, because that would be closer to San Antonio to try and keep some of those fans. Yeah. It's, I just don't. I just don't logistically see it happening. Uh, I think saying. I think part of it may be a ploy too because they're going to want a new building sooner than later. Uh, in San Antonio, and it may be a ploy to be, hey, San Antonio, make sure you give us some money to keep us here. But they got Wimby now, too, so that doesn't, you know, they don't need it as much. Uh, yeah. But, no, I'm, I'm happy to see it. I'm happy that they're coming into Austin. I hope they convert more Austin people into Spurs fans so I have more Spurs fans here in Austin to enjoy the all the wins Wimby is going to have in his career. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of it. Uh, I, I can understand why San Antonio people may be, may be a little scared about it. I understand yeah, that. Yeah. But I, I, I'm hoping that that is not ever going to be an issue, uh, that they'll stay the San Antonio Spurs and they'll just come down and we'll have a great relationship right down I-35. You know, we've, we've worked at places that want to connect Austin and San Antonio. They're different yeah, cities, yeah. but oh, yeah. businesses want that to be Dallas-Fort Worth. Yes, yeah, the corporations want it very much. Even there was talk recently about a Major League Baseball franchise, right, another one uh, yeah. in Texas. And the talk is that they would like it in in uh, Austin or in San Antonio, but they would like to be able to take advantage of both markets. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they, want, they want the fans from both markets, uh, but they want to put the franchise in either San Antonio or in Austin, but they would like it to be almost a corridor, like you said, a metroplex. Yeah. Now, we are probably decades away from that actually being something logistically that can happen, but you're right, corporations for for years for in different ways and we work for radio stations who try to do the same yep. thing right they they want to really combine those two communities but the communities are so different and the cultures of the cities are so different and yet they want to almost kind of make them one <laughs> right they, they 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 really want to try to turn them into one collective group and it's just they're just it's, it's often in san antonio if you lived in either one of them you realize like oh man they're just very, very different communities. And yeah. I don't know, I don't, they're, they're looking for what will align them, like what are the commonalities between the two communities. And there are some commonalities between people in San Antonio and people in Austin. I don't know if there are enough of them yet for them to be almost considering them to be, oh man, let's uh, combine them as to one collective demographic, the folks in San Antonio yeah. and Austin. No, we're all Texans, but we ain't that, we, we're not that, we're not that we're alike. Not alike. No, and no, that's, that's a really, really good thing, good. by the way. Santa has got his own culture, and Austin's got his own culture. Exactly. No, and I, and I like I get it on paper. It makes a ton of sense on paper. It does because oh, it makes a lot of sense. it makes <laughs> a lot of straight <laughs> cash. San, San, yeah. San Antonio is an avid, a rabid fan base. They love their teams. You know, they're like the only UFL, XFL, whatever league. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. they're the only one who ever like really turns profit. They're a real loyal fan base. We know they're from the Spanish. Very loyal. Yeah. And in Austin, there's a lot of money. 
And, and also, also very loyal to the Longhorns, but everybody knows the Longhorns are going to be the team that Matilda are most loyal to in Austin. And not just the Longhorns, as you talked about, Longhorn football specifically. Yeah. Not even all the other Longhorn sports get to enjoy that loyalty. Longhorn, Longhorn football, football specifically. Specifically <laughs> at, the, at the level that they're talking about. Because, yeah. like, baseball has a great fan base. They sell out their tickets every year, but it's a smaller building. Yes. So they don't, it's not, so there is a very big, I don't want to, because I don't want to, Disparage. I don't need the baseball fans no, no, no. coming after us. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the, the, the amount of the amount of influence and affluence. Yes. The, bil- the billionaires and the sh- the billionaires that are in the city. There are more billionaires in Austin than there are in San Antonio, right? A lot of the money comes to, to Austin. Like you said, they got the fan loyalty in San Antonio, but the big money in Austin. And that's what supports football usually because football is the revenue producing sport, has the most influence. Yeah. It'll have the most eyeballs on it. So they basically would like to get that culture of Texas football in terms of the corporate influence and affluence. Yeah. But they also want to get the ground roots loyalty and fandom and passion of San Antonio folks. And I got to tell you, they're very different. <laughs> it's going it's to be a, it's, it's tough to do it, but that's the challenge. That's the challenge. They want to sell the first five rows and all the suites to Austin, and they want to sell the rest <laughs> of the building to San Antonio. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. There you go. Right, there you go. Go. Hey man, we want this high dollar stuff. We want that to come in, and we want billionaires to buy season tickets of it. We want corporations to buy the season tickets, so we don't have to try and sell courtside every game. We don't have to try and yep, sell yep. that certain people own these, and they're done. And we know that money's in our bank account. That clears every year. Do we know every single yep, month yep. that money's clearing? So they would rather have that, and you know that's harder to do in a place where people's uh, like. Our income are more like us, Rod, where we're like oh. we're picking and choosing games we can go to. Yeah, and, and to that point, though, though, and that's, that's why, why he is such an attraction, right? He's such a phenomenon. He's actually one of those generational talents and players who you could start that movement with. Yeah. He that's is that big that's where some sort of go, man, you know what? I ain't got that much uh, disposable uh, income, but I might try to find a way to get to that game and see what you mean. Yeah, because it's, it's, you know, because he's one of those types of athletes. I mean, there aren't that many athletes, guys, that will force everyday Americans to, who are not necessarily avid, ra- you know, rabid, passionate sports fans, to evaluate their uh, entertainment uh, costs uh, in terms of their household and go, you know what, I got to try to get to that game to see Wimby. I mean, LeBron's in that conversation. I mean, who's more of a a a must see? Because uh, I'm talking about in person here, all right? In I mean, everybody can watch it. I'm talking about who who right now in sports is more of a must-see attraction than Wimby. LeBron's – Messi's in there. Messi, let's just start there. Right Messi's at the top, right? Yeah. Patrick yeah. Mahomes is probably in that, at the top of that conversation. For a lot I think, of people I think Patrick talk. Mahomes falls into, like, the Luka Doncic, where it's just that low – one below where you go. It's amazing, but I don't necessarily need to see that in person because they're not – they're, they're – it at least look like more regular people. Whereas Messi's like shorter and then gets to go do what he does on the, the soccer field and runs around. You see what LeBron, LeBron doesn't look like a normal person. Like he's six, yeah, eight. Yeah, you're talking about the, the, the freakishness. The freakishness. Yeah, freakish, 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 okay, if you yeah, want to yeah. go, if you love basketball, watching Jokic live is one of the most fun things you can do because you can just watch him and he just does tiny things the entire game and he's constantly just doing things to help the team. And he's so good. But they're subtle, and the camera's not on him all the time. So if you're watching the game and you're – that's fine. Mm. But if you're a basketball fan, you just sit there and watch Jokic play and his positioning on the court and how he's moving people around and how he's setting up an offense and how he's moving around and and dictating how the defense is playing to him. You watch all that, then you're like, that's amazing fun. But for the normal fan, you go, no, I'd rather see LeBron James dunk a ball or or Luka Doncic put up 45 points or something like that. So it changes what you want to see in a game. No, that's no, a good point. I, I think I, if you're a if you're a kind of nerd, a basketball nerd, yeah, you know that you, that answer changes for you. If you're a novice fan, you're just like, man, I just want to see some freaky stuff on the yeah. basketball court in person. Then you are like, yeah, I got to see LeBron because they don't make LeBrons every day, right? LeBron's a generational athlete, but also a generational frame in terms of that type of skill with that frame, and that's Wimby. He's in that category. Your point about Patrick Mahomes, I'm a I'm a football nerd. So I'm like, I want Patrick Mahomes in person. That's legit. I saw him in the Super Bowl. I'm like, man, that dude is amazing in person. But you're right. It, it's more subtle and discreet some of the stuff he's doing. It'd probably be for a lot of fans. They probably want to see something like Lamar Jackson in person because yeah. on the field, it's a lot freakier. So I get your freaky factor is a great point about that too in terms of football nerds and basketball nerds. But then that's a great question for the text line, 
Who's more of a must see spectacle and attraction right now than Wimby? Because it's, it's, it's the list Shohei is not the, the list ain't long. Is Shohei right now? Shohei's got to be in that. Yeah, he's got to be there. Just because you just, I mean, a guy that's elite at both the plate and on the mound. I mean, we have we've never even seen that before. But just to say you were in, that you've seen him in person, just that factor, I think, with Shohei, it, yeah. it goes a long way. Like, no, I, I've seen Shohei in person. You know, the, the guy that did did things that nobody else in the history of baseball has ever done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's in. He's on that list. Good point. It's Messi. It's Shohei. I'm trying to think. It's like I said, it's not, LeBron's still on that list. He's he's been up there forever. If football, like, you're right. I mean, football, I, I, I think Patrick Mahomes will be at the top of the football list, but I don't know if it, because it, of the way football set up, the ultimate team game, um, not really being able to see the players' faces. and yeah. It doesn't necessarily lend itself to, I got to get out and see that guy because we've never seen anything like it. Um, Patrick Mahomes is in that category, but like you said, it's not the freaky factor. It's more like watching Jokic do his thing. I think, I think Lamar Jackson would probably be one of the closest. He's probably Maybe the closest. Wide receiver like a Jamar Chase or a Justin Jefferson or Tyreek Hill that you just, that. Yeah. just do crazy things. Tyreek Hill may be up there. Just some freaky stuff. Yeah, just one of those guys that just does amazing things on the field. But like Lamar Jackson, when he made the play uh, in the playoffs where the ball got tipped and he caught his own pass and ran it for like 10 more yards. <laughs> yeah, that, was that, yeah. that is something that you it's say like, to go, what? no, I just watch a quarterback catch his own pass and then he ran the ball. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right about that. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, all right, there you go. So uh, Wimby coming to town. Look, a lot of people are debating like, hey, man, how can I get to that Wimby game? Uh, I know I may not have the bread, but I'm going to find the bread to get out there and see Wimby in person. And I'll tell you, so if you want to see the better matchup and you want to see Jokic, which I again said is so much fun to watch as a basketball fan, that's tonight. That's a more expensive game. They play on Sunday against the Nets as well here in town. Those tickets are cheaper because <laughs> not there's not a star on the Nets. You get to McCall Bridges. And, that's and, true. You know, so you'll, the, but then, so if you, if you can only afford to go to one and you yeah, want to yeah, go yeah. and enjoy yourself and have a good time, you just want to see Wimby. You don't necessarily care about the, the Nuggets. Go, go Sunday. Be a ball on the budget. Go, yeah. Because yeah. I was like the cheapest tickets that I saw, and this was last weekend when I was looking. Cheapest tickets for tonight were ninety dollars. Cheapest tickets for Sunday were forty five. Okay. So yeah, yeah. it was a little bit more affordable on Sunday. Yeah, I mean that's what you get when you got the you know you got the. The MVP, MVP and you got Wimpy, number one overall pick. You got a lot of storylines. Uh, and like you said, they'll be matching up at times uh, in, that, in that game uh, with, with Denver coming up tonight. All right. Uh, so good conversation about – we'll talk more about the Spurs. I believe right now, if I'm not mistaken, I, I hadn't looked at it in a, a few days. I used to keep up with it. Uh, Wimby is still leading the NBA in blocks. He's got and, it. I mean, I yeah, because it's just, yeah. I mean, he had. I stopped. So I stopped checking. I was like, I'm checking this every day. Was with me. Um, I still don't understand how some people are saying he's not going to win Defensive Player of the Year, and I guess it would only be because their record is. I, so this sad. is what I'm curious yeah. about it because it's everyone so I've heard say that, that. Everyone I've heard say that also follows it up with, "Well, I'm going to vote for him, but, and I'll vote for him, and my vote is for him, but I don't think other people will. So he may still win it." Uh, it's going to depend too. Now that Carl Anthony Towns is out, Rudy Gobert is one of the favorites. Minnesota has some of the favorites. What they do now that Carl Anthony Towns is going to be out for extended <laughs> period of time, uh, you know, if they if they kind of slip up a little bit, then maybe that knocks them down. But if they're the one seed, it helps them mm-hmm. out. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think when you look at him, and the biggest difference is the Spurs defense is bad. But if you look at the numbers between how bad they are when Wimby's on and when he's off, they're okay defense when Wimby's on the court. They are complete catastrophe when he is not on the court. <laughs> so, see that. Yeah. So the reality is when you look at it and you go, well, he is the best defender because this team would be giving up 140 a night without him. Yeah, was it, yeah. at one game he missed, didn't the opposing team shoot like there was some crazy number at the rim? It was like 70 for 75 five percent or something exactly. like that at the rim. It was crazy. There's also uh, there's also a great new conspiracy theory about Wimby. Oh no, that was, everybody was, who shows up uh Wimby has ended up injured. <laughs> and there's like four or five players that who, like make it's a bad highlight highlight against them. Yeah, like, highlight, like, against like it started with the Kai Jones from Texas who highlighted him and then was out of the league like two weeks later. <laughs> so is it is it is it just they talking about just bad luck? They see the basketball guys don't want you to make Wimby look bad. <laughs> no, they're saying. And then the hey, later, you know Alfred Shingoon put up 45 against Wimby and then he was yeah. wheeled off the court like a week later. You know what? Honestly, Patrick. The, listen, how oh, the hell did Browns put up 70 against him? He's out. 
Just tell me uh, this. It's a funny conspiracy that I've seen. And you're like, it's just the, the pace and a lot of players get hurt in the NBA. Mm, but no, it no, is. But the I'm, basketball I'm, gods seem to be smiling on Wimby, if you want to look at it that way. Dude, I, I, I think it is something to that. First of all, he got drafted by the team that he wanted to get drafted by. He spoke that into existence. And then how the hell the Spurs get the number one overall pick again? the basketball gods in their favor. John Morant, too. John Morant crossed him up and dunked on him. John Morant, two weeks later. A shoulder surgery out for the season. Hey, you know what? Honestly, I'm 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 more. <laughs> I think I, I am more in the cap of the conspiracy theorists out there that the basketball gods they they don't want you messing with Wimby, man. Do not mess with Wimby, Wimby Don't mess with Wimby for sure. Uh, all right, good stuff there. Let's get to the uh, horn headlines, and then after that, uh, we'll talk about the Texans extending Joe Mixon. A little surprising, and also the Cowboys re-signing one of their own. Uh, they're working. You know, it's very discreet, subtle moves the Cowboys are making here. Um, after the frenzy of free agency. But I got to tell you, I like the couple of moves they've made. It's only been a couple, but I, I really like them. We'll talk about that on the other side. Let's hit the horn headlines with my man, Patrick Davis. All right, your horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The Houston Texans signed their new running back, Joe Mixon, to a contract extension yesterday. The new contract is for three years and $27 million with a reported $13 million in guaranteed money. Mixon, who turns 28 in July, spent the first seven seasons of his career in Cincinnati and was a pro bowler in 2021. The Mavericks lost last night to the Oklahoma City Thunder 126-119 to in a game that Luka Doncic missed due to soreness in his left hamstring. He will be reevaluated this weekend. And Jalen Green scored a season-high 37 points to help the Rockets beat the Wizards 135-119. to The Rockets are now just three and a half games back from Golden State for the 10th seed and final play in spots. Elsewhere in the NBA, the Spurs play their first of two games at the Moody Center tonight as they welcome the defending champion Nuggets to Austin and then face the Brooklyn Nets on Sunday. This marks the second year the Spurs have played home games in Austin in an attempt to connect fans to the city just down I-35. Texas softball finished off BYU in the opening game of the weekend series by run rule in the fifth, 13-0. Mac Morgan picks up the win, pitching all five innings and only allowing one hit. And Texas baseball starts their series with Washington tonight at Dish Falk Field. Texas will send LeBaron Johnson and Cody Howard to the mound on Friday and Saturday, but are waiting to make a decision on Sunday starter. Texas bullpen showed improvement in their series last weekend, and Coach David Pierce will look to get the same improvement from the starters against a Huskies team who has struggled to score at points this season. That is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the horn headlines. Uh, We'll go behind the burnt orange curtain next segment, talk a little Texas football. Got spring football coming up. I know a lot of people are excited about that. So uh, we'll get into some Texas football conversation. Let's stick to the NFL right now. Uh, You brought it up in the horn headlines, Patrick. The Texans, after after trading for Joe Mixon and getting him on an extremely uh, team-friendly contract because uh, he was in the uh, kind of last year of his deal, he they, they, they decided to extend him. Uh, replaces the final year of his Bengals contract, which would have paid him, I think, roughly yeah, close to $6 million. Uh, but the base value of his new three-year deal, of uh, $25.5 million in this three-year deal. Uh, I think he's got half a million in incentives. Um, I said it's – Joe Mixon, if I'm not mistaken, is right at 27 years old, if I, if I get that correct. I believe he's yeah, right he's at 28 in July. Yeah, so he's right at 27 years old. He'll be 28 next season. Let's put it that way. And okay, so it 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 could end up being a wise investment for the Texans if he outplays that deal. But the truth is, running backs traditionally they peak at the age of 27. At least most of them do. Now he may be a freakish outlier. That could very well be the case. But most running backs they peak at 27. By the time they turn 28, their production begins to drop by 15 percent. Uh, then by 25%, by the time they turn 29, by the time they're 30, um, we're talking about like 40% drop. Now, this is statistics over the last 20 years. Like I said, Joe Mixon may be an outlier, but it's interesting to me that they decided to to, to invest heavily in the running back position. And we know that Nick Casario doesn't really – he doesn't really like longer term deals, right? He's got like yeah. one to two year deals, uh, kind of a rent to own philosophy. Um, you don't buy running back position. You rent the running back position. Uh, this is more of an investment to, um, to purchase. <laughs> All right. It, to it be heavily invested in Joe Mixon. I don't necessarily think it's, the wisest move. I'll say that. I don't know. So I don't. I don't know if it's a bad move. I won't say it's a bad, but I don't know if it's a really shrewd move to go extending twenty-seven-year-old running backs to three-year deals. I, but this is you know the same as I do. 
It's all funny money except for the guaranteed, and only thirteen yes. of it's guaranteed. That's so true. So we say thirteen million, and probably that two is the first two years. So the third year is basically the team option. If we're looking at it, most likely, I doubt they're going to have guaranteed money in that last deal. And if they on the last year, and if they do have any guaranteed money on that last year, it's probably under three million. So it's basically a two year deal in real terms because they can cut him after two if they want to. And you have a guy now in your locker room who wants to be there, who feels like he's part of the team. He feels you're trying to build the culture there. I think it's a decent move to build the culture to not bring in a guy who's supposed to be a pivotal part of your offense next season and have him worried that he's not going to be taken care of. But even if you cut him after next year, you're probably going to be out six to eight million dollars. Like yeah, under the nine, the, like you said. So yeah, you have yeah, an out yeah. after this season. It's not if the guaranteed money was more, it would bother me because paying nine a year is a little bit, you know, you go, that's what Joe Mixon's value would have been on the market was around nine. So yep, he's yep. getting paid about market value for this season. And you have an out after this year and the year after that, if you want, but also he can't walk away after either one of those years either. And you don't have to continually try and bring him back. Like if you talk about the, 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 uh, the mercenary deals, I, I'm sure there's part of it with Nick Casario where he's learning a lesson too in trying to resign some of these guys that are now happily walking away. And he may be learning in this off season, you know what? I don't want to be the college team that has to keep recruiting my guys all year long because of the transfer portal, because I'm signing them to one, two year deals. Maybe I'll get them on three and I'll just lower that guaranteed money. So I have my outs and I basically have a team option on him on that third seat, that third year. And I can cut him if I need to. And no, I don't just, I, I think that's no, hard for me. It's if the money, if the guaranteed money, I agree with you. If the guaranteed money was up at like 21 million, 22, I'm not a fan of it. But at 13, that doesn't scare but me. You, but, but you lose the value, value of the having, having him on the last, the last contract, contract of his – the last year of his contract with the Bengals. You lose that. The whole point was you got value in the trade. The value in the trade was he was going to make $6 million and he was going to be basically on – Essentially, a cost-effective, team-friendly contract. Now you lose that value because you replaced the last year that deal, so you're paying him nine million. So he's probably not going to outperform that contract. The point was you guys outperforming your deals, so you're ahead of the running back on the contract year. First part, you get hurt. You still got the guarantees. He's playing the running back position. That's the main up position out there, and he is a little bit older. So why not let him play on the contract year? Unless you're just trying to make the guy happy, and I get that. But why not let him play on the contract year and then try to resign? Because you're still going to end up coming around the same thing. thing. It's, it's not, not like running back like a demand right top top, top, top dollar, dollar uh, salary cap value, value these days. So, so my point, point is, is, you lose the value. The value. Now, now, yes, I'm not. I agree with everything you said, but you still lost the value. The point of a talent acquisition is find and extract value from it. You just lost it. You just gave it away. You gave it away. Now you can get it back on the other end. If he just has an all pro year, maybe that is the case. But if he gets hurt, you'll see more value. So why I, not stand pat and take the value initially, and then if he starts outperforming that contract, outperforming those numbers that year, then you can pay him. Why are no, we paying I, him for a production that he hadn't even done yet? No, I agree. I agree with that. That I'd love to have him for three million dollars less a year, which is basically what it would have been. So you're paying him an extra three million dollars this season. You're giving him more money next year too. I, I'm, I'm with you on all of that. You want the value to be up there. I, I also don't. It, it, you know. I, if it was a deal that he showed up in the day he showed up, they said, let's work on that extension. And there was no conversation between the two where he said, I, you know what guys, I'm not playing. I don't want to be here on this. Like this is not, I need security. I just got traded. I don't know what the conversations were behind the scenes, but it's hard to imagine that they made the trade. And I get the trade too. When you realize if you're Nick Casario and if you don't get one of these top running backs, that window is you're closing it for this year because you don't have a running back. And if you don't have a running back, you close the window. So, all right, windows, we're waiting another year. doesn't matter. Every other move we just made is out the window because we we don't have a running back. And we don't have a running game. We're, we're screwing over our young quarterback in our, in our offense because we have no running game, just like last season. And so I think that there was a bit of urgency of we have to get one. We just watched a bunch of other ones sign. And so I, if I get that seventh-round pick to guarantee I have a guy, and then we can negotiate – a team friendly deal where I'm not giving 20 something million in guaranteed money because now I only have to give 13 million in guaranteed money because he's already on my roster. I can negotiate a much more team friendly deal because he's already here and there's no one else bidding on him right now. I think there's parts in that. I agree with you. You're not getting the value anymore. I you're hundred percent right in that, but I think that I, I don't mind it as much just because the guarantee is so low. 
Yeah, I just said I don't I think mean, so. it's it's a great pickup. You needed a running back, but you just lost all the value you extracted out there. You just lost it. You just gave it away. And, and, and like I said, if he gets hurt next season, which running backs often do because they're a very banged up position, and he's twenty seven years old, you're still you're losing still value, value there. there. Like, my point was let him play out, out the season, season, or at least show you the production on the field. You'll pay him. And then you'll get them on. Then you can sign them to that two-year deal, front loaded, and you also got the the value of having him on that last year of that Bengals contract. Then you can get even more value going ahead by paying him, like you said, the nine million guarantees the first year and the four million guarantees. I just don't understand why the sense of urgency to do it. Um, but like you said, maybe they want to make him happy. I mean, that's that's not really your job as a GM. <laughs> really know that, but your job is to try to acquire talent um, and acquire value in talent acquisition, really. And like I said, I think you just gave it away at a position that we all agree de it declines in value at a rapid rate, probably yeah. quicker than any other position in the league. And you're just paying it at 27 years old, which is geriatric. In the is. Back and, and I mean, I think you're also I think you may try and draft a running back this year again as well at some point in the draft. And, you know, you get a little bit more security now knowing, well, if we draft a guy and he turns out to be awesome, then we move on from Joe Mixon yeah. a year or two. And if we draft a guy and he misses, well, we'll draft another guy next year and hopefully that guy will hit and then we'll move on after Mixon there. I, I, I get the security part of it. I, I You're 100% right that I, we like the deal better and the value better at the old contract. 100%. That's true. Uh I, I feel like there has to be a reason they did this because it doesn't fit the Casario normal model. It, it, does doesn't, not. it doesn't. So it feels like there's a external factor, whether it was Mixon, you know, not wanting to get on the plane to Houston or whether it was CJ Stroud asking for it or whether it was Bobby Slowick asking for it or CJ or D'Amico Ryan's asking for it. I feel like there was probably an external factor that somebody else went to Casario and said, please, can we make sure he's here for a couple seasons? Because and yeah. all of those, all of the people I just named should be able to make that decision. Because if you're Bobby Slowick now, you're in the position that if you're Nick Sarah, you say, I'm trying to keep him too. I'm hoping yeah. that he doesn't take a job. I'm hoping he pulls a Ben Johnson and tells them in the air to turn the plane around. <laughs> that was a yeah, you're right about that. that's a good point. No, it's like I said, it, it, I, I don't know, it, there's no right or wrong uh, yeah. answer here. I just, it's my well, mind. There is, there is, we won't know it until next year in the year, like, then we'll know the right or wrong answer. We'll, we'll know, yeah. but even if he even if he gets you a thousand yards, he was already running for a thousand yards. He was a good, he was a guy that had, had no, no, he did, he had yards, 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 in a really cheap manner at a cheap rate, and then you pay him for the production that you get in the first year. That you expect the next year. Like you pay somebody else. Why would you do that? You don't have to. You do it. You trade it for him. You trade that for that. You have a team already there. What the hell are you doing? No, but that's, that, 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 those, 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 those little tiny, tiny ways of extracting out that, that, that is how you know it works. And you, and you don't, don't, don't just get away like, like that. that. No, you continue to do what the Baltimore Ravens did with Lamar Jackson. You're like, yeah, I know you are performing your deal, but we want another year out of it. <laughs> we want to get another year of that great value. That's what the NFL does. That's what that's the fifth year option is about. That's what the franchise tag is about. I am curious. I'm going to be curious to see how the contract is structured. Just because it, it is, if you say, you know, if it if it's front loaded, then it's still weird. But then you can say, well, we're basically going to get him for free on our cap for a year and a half. And then we'll have this guy that, you know, when we're trying to build other pieces to see what we need to add to try and get to a Super Bowl win. I think there's reasons, I, but I'm with you. It doesn't make sense unless I know what that other reason is. Yeah, I'm just no, assuming you, that you, there you is. Right I'm giving right the benefit of the doubt, but I'm yeah, assuming yeah. there's this other factor that I'm not that we're not thinking of right now. Yeah, no, no, no that's no, a good no, point. No, you, you you convinced me that there's a reasonable, rational argument to the other side. Uh, I just, like I said, I would be a hardcore GM, and I they would hate guys would hate me. It is pretty. <laughs> players would hate me. They'd be like, man, that guy's no soul. He is cold and heartless. Uh, but no, nah, man, I'm looking at just from everything from a value perspective. But you're right. There's a human element. 
And yeah. Nick has, yeah. a, has a reputation now as a guy who won't give long-term deals to anybody. Yeah. Then you're right. The players talk and the players will be like, yeah, I'm not going there, man. I'm not going to play as a mercenary every damn year. That's not what I want to do. I want some security. So maybe that is part of it. Maybe he doesn't like that reputation and now he wants to start changing the narrative a little bit. That could be it. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, good stuff there. We come back. I do want to get to the Cowboys signing of Jordan Lewis, a one-year deal, uh, and it's a damn good one. So we'll talk about that uh, when we get a chance coming up a little later on. Let's go behind the burnt orange curtain, though, next segment. Let's talk some Texas spring football questions and concerns uh, about the Texas offense. We'll do defense and offense, but going into the spring, what are the biggest questions? What are the biggest issues, uh, biggest concerns Longhorn fans have? And will they get clarity? Will those questions be answered during Texas spring football season? We'll talk about that and more when we go behind the burnt orange curtain. This is the Rodcast on a free flag 512 Friday edition of the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I am Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back from home. Good stuff. Good stuff.
All right, welcome back to uh, the Rodcast. Time to go behind the burnt orange curtain. Uh, I want to get to, and we'll do it uh, the next time we go behind the burnt orange curtain. I want to get to uh, questions, concerns um, about the uh, Texas football team. Position by position, uh, we'll go through questions and concerns, position by position, and uh, see how many of those will be answered, how much clarity we'll get uh, on those questions, on those issues during spring football season. So we'll do that next time we go behind the burnt orange curtains because we're a little bit uh, close to it. We went over uh, in the first segment, but had a lot to get into. And still, didn't get into all the things that I want to talk about. I still want to talk about the Cowboys re-signing uh, Jordan Lewis, which I think is pretty big. But one story that's been really cool in NFL free agency uh, right now is the Denver Broncos acquiring uh, Brandon Jones in free agency. So uh, they got Brandon Jones uh, now as a member of the uh, Denver Broncos, and Malcolm Roach now <laughs> is a member of the Denver Broncos. So now there are five Longhorns uh, right now on the Denver Broncos uh, team. You got uh, Malcolm Roaches on there. You got uh, Caden Stearns. Uh, PJ Locke is a member of there. Brandon Jones now also uh, a member of there, and Little Jordan Humphrey. Uh, also, is the latest too. Little Jordan Humphrey is a part of that crew too. So it's been a while since any team. I don't know if any team's ever had three Longhorn DBs. Uh, shout out to DBU on the roster at the same time. Um, but five guys. I'm sure there's been five. I was on the Detroit Lions. We had a bunch of guys on the Detroit Lions all at one time. Roy Williams, myself, uh, Big Sean Rogers, uh, Will Matthews is part of that group at one time. So uh, the Lions heavily represented uh, the Longhorns at one point. But now it seems to be the Denver Broncos. They like that orange, different kind of orange. Uh, they like that burnt orange. One thing I've noticed though about all these guys and it really popped off the page to me uh when i saw all of these different players four out of these five guys uh on this denver broncos uh roster right now that played at texas they were among the most versatile players at texas at the time and even when they went to the nfl were really versatile players First of all, Brandon Jones, First of all, I've been talking about this for the DBs for a while, that versatility is something that Sark more and more that he is starting to covet in recruiting it's, it, when it comes to the defensive backs and maybe it comes to defenders, period. He wants versatile defenders. Uh, I remember his media availability, the press conference he had where he was introducing the latest recruiting class and he was describing all the defensive backs. I remember I went and wrote down how often he uh, you know, just used the term versatile to describe these players. Uh, he used versatile probably six or seven times describing these defensive backs. Uh, when he when he described uh, Kobe Black, he called him versatile. Uh, he called him a three position player when he described Makuba coming in. Um, described him as versatile. Dabo Sweeney actually said he could play any position in the secondary. Jordan Johnson Rubel called him versatile and position flex. Santana Wilson called him versatile and said he had versatility. It was it was a common theme uh, when he was talking about his defensive backs, and I don't think that was a coincidence. And you go look at at like the you know the greatest DBs at Texas um, who uh, went on to be drafted in the NFL and, and some who didn't get drafted right undrafted free agents like a PJ Locke uh, like an Adrian Phillips and I, I counted those guys in this research too um, man you go look at it more than half uh, of the defensive backs that have made a roster in the NFL as a drafted or an undrafted free agent they played multiple positions in college or played multiple positions when they got to the NFL. Uh, whether you're talking about Quinn Jammer, myself, Nathan Basher, Huff Daddy, Michael Griffin, uh, Aaron Williams, Kenny Vaccaro, Mikael Thompson, Quandre Diggs, you know, Brandon Jones, one of those guys, uh, Adrian Phillips, PJ Locks, one of those guys. Um, so it, it, it versatility matters. I think it, it gives you more solutions, more possible solutions when the offense is going to present you with matchup problems, which is what every uh, offense is designed to do these days with personnel formation, present you with matchup problems. And if you want to be able to find easier solutions to those matchup problems, which essentially they're trying to turn pass defenders into run defenders, trying to turn run defenders into pass defenders, you need versatile defenders who actually can uh, match up and depending on the situation, um, their skill set is malleable and you can, and it can, and it can fit uh, uh, seamlessly into any uh, situation you put them in. And that's what that versatility offers. You got to get play nickel. That means he's used to the action happening really fast. It's got to be instinctual. You also got to be a, a force run defender. You got to be a guy that also is not afraid to take on blocks, uh, tight ends, and sometimes even offensive linemen. Uh, you also got to know how the 
the blitz and that kind of timing. You got to know how to cover, of course, from the nickel position. If you're playing safety, I mean, you think about how you have to process information as a safety, pick up on all the clues that the offense has given you, whether that be the formation, personnel grouping, uh, whether that be the personnel itself, the alignment uh, of different personnel, whether that be the down and the distance. As a safety, you're processing all of these different clues and trying to come up with the uh, how the offense is going to try to expose you, how they're going to try to attack you and get a leg up, right, and get an advantage. And all of these guys that I'm naming here, they were, they were versatile defenders. They were able to do that. Malcolm Roach played uh, the B-backer. He played the Fox. He played middle linebacker. He played defensive tackle. He played defensive in at Texas. He played like five positions on the defense, and he gets to the New Orleans Saints, and what they say about him, Oh, we love the fact that he can play. He can move on, uh, around the line. We can put him at any gap on the, on the line. We can move him around different shades, and he can line up uh, at DN. He can line up in the four eye. He can line up at the one technique. He can line up at the three technique. And he's also another versatile defender. I even said when Caden Stearns was on the 40 acres, I think he could have played nickel. I still think uh, they probably should have moved him to nickel and moved P.J. Locke to safety. P.J. Locke ends up moving to safety when he gets to the, to the NFL. But I think Caden Stearns had that ability, um, but a versatile defender nonetheless uh little jordan humphrey i mean came out of high school as one of the most versatile football players uh, in the state guy played running back wide receiver played some quarterback hell even here at texas but they would put him in the wildcat sometimes and let him run he would play that flex tight end position as a matter of fact when he went to the patriots Bill Belichick remarked um, that he was a really interesting offensive player. He said didn't have the ideal frame and ideal skill set to play wide receiver, but he said we just like him as a football player. And they were thinking about using him as a flex tight end, kind of how Texas would. They would put him at that flex tight end spot. And I, I think when you start looking at all these guys and the skill sets they have, maybe that's something that Denver Broncos are also starting to covet, period. As a as a football organization, now with Sean Payton there, they're going, no, no, we want versatile football players. We want guys who have not only to manufacture depth for us, but also to offer us solutions, uh, whether it be offensively or defensively. That's what versatility will do. It will give you more options, give you more flexibility, give you more malleability, give you more solutions, Patrick, when teams are trying to present you with problems. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's also something to be said of the more you learn about the game and the more you learn about – just understanding where everyone on the field and everyone's assignments, the better you can do your job, the better you can do. We talk about in coaching all the time, guys who have spent a little bit of time on the opposite side of what they coach tend to have a better understanding of how to defeat that side. So the more positions you stand across when you're standing and you go, I know where every other DB, I know where everyone in this backfield that we're in uh, should be and what their job is. So I understand if something's falling off, if I see something on theirs, I can yell across the way on them or we can all help each other because I understand how everything works. And if we all understand, we can all help each other. We can all see if somebody slips, we can understand to go up and help out in that situation. We can do all these things because we've been in that position. We've, we've trained at that position. We understand that. So it's a lot of positives where you can get a specialist and you can hope that that one specialist will be perfect at the one thing and perfect but nobody's perfect so even yeah, when you train so just on one thing it, it's hard to, it's you know you're gonna have those mistakes in reality the more you can spread your knowledge base across all of those positions it, and it, it just is going to help you in the long run understand how the game is flowing understand what you're seeing and it, it can't do any harm let's put it that way no, no, that's a great point, Patrick, about the just your, your football IQ, yeah, like your your sports yeah. acumen overall. Uh, it can only help you being able to learn all those different positions and then know the you'll know the whys of the defense. Yeah, not just the how of the defense, but you're understanding the why of the, the defense, and that's really, really important. All right, good stuff there, Patrick. We'll uh come back. We'll get the big fat poll of the day on the other side. My man Patrick Davis, and also I believe we're gonna start our uh, 512 Fridays up, yes. uh, coming up next segment, too. So all of that and more when we return. This is a freak flag, feel good, fake it till you make it, Rick Flair. Woo! 512 Friday edition of the Rodcast with my man Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
Back on the broadcast on a 512 Friday where we play local music. You can go check out around town this weekend. Of course, it's South by, so there's tons and tons and tons going on. I'm trying to pick shows that I think none of these are wristband shows. Uh, so if you don't have a wristband, you can go to any of these. A lot of these are free shows. Uh, some may have a small cover, but a lot of these shows happening around town. Uh, this week is going to be a lot of fun. I also say weather permitting on some of these shows as well. We know it's supposed to rain tomorrow, so it could be weather permitting for some of these as well. But this is Jackie right Vinson, one of the best in town. Uh, she's doing a show at Armadillo Den on Saturday. She'll be at other places as well. So if you can check out her website, she'll be around town playing different shows. But Saturday at Armadillo doing, uh, Den doing uh, Jam in the Van. Uh, they do out there at Armadillo Den. Jam in the Van. <laughs> I like that. They, they do that. I believe they record these, and then they'll put out some of the audio from it later and uh, mix it up and make it sound all nice and pretty. But Jackie Vince in there, uh, one of the best, one of the best here in town. Uh, if you want to go check her out uh, during this, yeah, it's 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 a good time of year, you know, to to find the free stuff around town. You can avoid. I the, that I made my one trip up yeah. north, uh, past the river, up north, past the river. <laughs> that's, hey, that's you know, we're north. South Austin people, <laughs> past the river. I went to Auditorium Shores. I went in, parked in the garage that was right there by it. There were spaces. I got down there like two thirty three park there i was i was home by seven <laughs> that's yeah that's exactly like, get, it. get out of well, dodge you gotta get up at four home by seven it's like no i gotta be home by seven I'm like, man i what i'm too i was like at least want to get out of dodge before it gets before it gets crazy down here that is awesome uh let's get to the big fat ball today 512-447-3776 512-447-3776 is the text line number Patrick's big fat poll of the day on the horn. All right, big fat poll of the day today. I was thinking about this. Is downtown and you know watching shows downtown. Uh, I you know the Moody Center has got the Spurs coming in this weekend, mm -hmm. and then we've all seen that the Irwin Center is finally actually coming down. So I thought I'd ask you guys a little nostalgia trip on a Friday. What was your favorite moment at the Irwin Center? What was your favorite moment at the Irwin Center? And it could be wow. buzzer beaters. Like, I remember being at the game when Javon Felix beat North Carolina with the buzzer beater, and I was sitting with my buddy who's a huge North Carolina fan, mm. and it was hilarious because we were not supposed <laughs> to beat them, and he was very upset. And I was like, oh, well, come on, man. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Had a whole night. We were supposed That's to go downtown good. and have drinks. And the whole time he was moping. It was great. Uh, but... <laughs> There's that, That's you know, awesome. I remember seeing Kevin Durant there in Texas, you know, winning the Big 12. I like I remember so many great moments and that's just basketball. Then the, the all the concerts you may have gone to and seen like really fun things that you've seen there. Uh, there's been a lot of great memories at the Irwin Center that people have yeah. here. So I want to ask you guys, what's your favorite moment at the Irwin Center as it is coming down? And, uh, you know, the Moody Center is taking over the spot and it's it is what it is, but I gotta tell you, um, man, my I don't know if it's my favorite moment, but it's definitely the one that stands out to me. I had a chance through like a radio promotion. Uh the whole Harlem Globe Trotters were in town. So I they they wanted me to go on the court with the Harlem Globe Trotters and like yeah, yeah. shoot a couple of shots during the game and then like do this funny thing where I have like a I don't know, a free throw contest or something like that. Anyway, uh I had just started dating my wife at the time and her and her family were going to the game. And uh, I was like, all right, he's like, just so you know, I'm supposed to do this like radio thing there at the game with the Harlem Globe. She's like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, I was supposed to be on. So I was kind of bragging because I thought she thought it was cool and she did, she did think it was cool. So I was trying to impress her. And <laughs> I went out there on the court. Uh, and like I said, they, they gave me the ball probably four times, four or five times, like during the game to like shoot and do stuff. Yeah. Patrick, I could not buy a bucket. <laughs> I did, did they not make. One of the shots that they they did threw they, up did there they for me. do the thing that they basically oh. they put you at the three point line and they give you the ball and they kind of back off and then when you miss it they get the ball back and give it back to you and let you do it again and then like have you come in the layup they did that drill they it wasn't like that drill it was like it was basically similar to that but yeah. they tried to do it during the game and then they stopped at one point and then I did like a free throw thing <laughs> it, either way dude, it was terrible it i was horrible the cr and the crowd some some of the people knew where i was they're like hey that's babies out there man he's someone of an athlete no i embarrassed <laughs> myself and i was so upset because I, I i'm a competitor i was so upset afterwards 
that I didn't even stop to talk to my now wife and her family. <laughs> I just left. <laughs> she was like, where are you? My family, they want to meet you. And I was like, I'm gone. I'm, I'm not there I'm anymore. Gone. No, I'm, I'm heading home and I don't want to see you. I don't want to see another human being. I need to go soak in my shame and how embarrassed I am about how I performed out there. It was so bad, man. It was bad. And that, is, that is a bucket list item for me bad. in radio. Oh. I would love to play for the Washington Generals against the Harlem Globetrotters. I would love to do it. Bro, uh, I, I, I look like I belonged on the Washington Generals. Like, but I, but I'll tell you this, over. is like I can play basketball. I just can't run up and down a court. That's I, the part that you could probably do better. I can play basketball still. I'll still shoot the ball all the time. We got yeah. a court out here at the station now and then. I'll go and shoot that's kind of, You would have been good in this because they basically like put me in and like as uh, coming off the bench kind of yeah, yeah. And just for a, for a little while. And they like I said, they were just giving me the, the basketball in really cool ways. Oh, couldn't. And, you know, they, nobody was like guarding me. I wasn't like getting like the hand in the face. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have, like, have to cross pick, anybody over. No, this is no, dude. This is like, this is like, you know, this is easy peasy, man. Just warm up stuff. Your boy couldn't buy, but you would have been better. You because you, you're a hooper. You hoop. Yeah. Like that. You know, your boy, I'm. Not, man, I, I was revealed to be a terrible basketball player. I think people <laughs> thought I was going to be good because I at one point was a world class athlete. No, guys, no, I was just a good football player. Sorry. Yeah. So that's my most embarrassing moment. That's, remember, that's the moment I remember the most. I don't know. So maybe for y'all, you said you want happy moments or you don't care what most hey, memorable. No, it, could be, it could be most memorable. It could be sad if okay. you want to throw in a sad one, but I like that. I like that story because it is definitely uh, memorable. Sad. Yeah. That was sad. <laughs> that's good stuff bro. i still feel bad about it or like i said you, some people probably had great concert moments in there too yeah exactly that's what i think a lot of people years. have great concert moments we see yeah. a, a lot of people graduated there high school graduations that's a great i, I graduated high school there i didn't even think of that damn i did not think about that at all actually that's a great i didn't think about that at all yeah a lot of people i yeah, yeah. I, I graduated high school there i didn't even think I didn't remember that because I didn't want to go. I did not care. That's not one, one of bids. the great moments of your life. I didn't care. <laughs> did not care one bit. The only reason I, I went is because my mom was not happy when I was like, I'm not going to that. <laughs> She's like, the hell you are going the hell to you that. Are. We already get sent an invitation. I'm like, it's stupid. I Like, I graduated. They'll send it to me in the mail. I don't care. Like, no, you're going. <laughs> Yeah, you go going, but mama, mama sacrificed for that, so she needs Yeah, I hate to tell yeah, you, I didn't care about high school when I was in it. I don't care now that I graduated either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, trust me, by the end, I think a lot of high school people feel like this. Like, I don't even know about that. Diploma. I don't know, know what my – do you know where your high school diploma is? I have no idea. I have no idea. Right? I don't think I know where mine is either. No. That's a great question. you got to figure that out. All right, uh, we come back. Uh, that's a great uh, question for the big fat poll of the day. I like that one. Uh, let, let me down uh, Let me down a dark, dark memory for myself. Uh, all right, we come back. We'll get into the Cowboys discussion because Stephen Jones spoke to me. He was at South by Southwest, too. I'm not sure if these comments are from South by Southwest where he took the private jet back to Dallas. Uh, but Stephen Jones talked to the media about everything, free agency, the running back position, Dak Prescott. Uh, we'll talk about all of it, and we'll also uh, dive deeper uh, down the, uh, the the free agency uh, rabbit hole, if you will, and talk about some of the other moves uh, that were made last, uh, actually uh, yesterday in free agency. All of that and more, we'll return right here on the broadcast uh, with my man Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Mohan Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
Welcome back to the Rodcast on a freak flag. Feel good. Fake it till you make it. Ric Flair. Woo! 512 Friday edition of uh, the Rodcast. And 512 Friday means that my man Patrick plays jams from local bands and artists, very talented human beings that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Tomar and the FCs. They're playing Sunday at Seaboys, among other shows during. But Sunday at Seaboys, they got the uh, indoor and outdoor stage over there. It'd be a fun time Sunday at Seaboys. Saw my man Tomar yesterday out uh, going out. It's part of a, was up on stage with him. He was doing the tribute to my brother, MC Overlord, was doing part of that during the show. So it was a, it's a nice. fun time to see Tomar out there. He's, a, he's very good. And this will tell you, they got the soul in there, and then they get up, and they get funky, too, and they get he gets going. And by the end of the set, you'll just see him pouring sweat dancing around is just, <laughs> he brings he brings it like if you've ever seen old school otis redden if him dancing around the stage and stuff that's what it reminds me of okay yeah uh, see I, there you go i mean trust me now I, I sweat when i get going too i'm a sweater <laughs> so i i know people out there who, who sweat just because they're when they're like really into something i i, I can sympathize because that's that's how your boy gets I, I trust me sometimes in here i'm sweating i don't know if y'all yeah. i'm like yes i get shiny no, Rod, Rod see me. Uh, Rod see me walk by the house of the dog, and it looks like I've gone through three marathons already. And it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, like, no, I just walked a mile here. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah, exactly. I know some people think it's a weight thing. It's like, no, it's not always a weight thing because no. your boy, like I said, man, I sweat. I sweat all the time, so I, I sympathize. Uh, all right, good stuff there. Five one two Friday. Appreciate my man Patrick. The idea you there always uh, bringing the vibe and energy to the show. Also. Uh, the idea you know, has the big fat poll of the day. You can go check that out on the text line 512-447-3776. Uh, Patrick, let the folks know what the big fat poll of the day is today. Big fat poll of the day because everything going on with the Moody Center hosting the Spurs and the, with the Irwin Center being taken down. What was your favorite moment at the Irwin Center? What was your favorite moment at the Irwin Center? We do. We got some high school graduations on there. We got some basketball games, some high school basketball games that people saw yes, and did. championship games over there. Some good stuff. Uh, some concerts like on the on the text line as well. Lots of good answers so far there on the text line. Yeah, no, it's uh, like I said, I I, I have a, a great, great memory there, but I have some. I mean, what did I say? What's the best concert that I attended at Irwin? I know, I've been to a few, and I'm not even a real big live music fan. You know that, Patrick. Yeah. But I've been to a few. Honestly, Jay Z might have been. I saw Jay Z there actually. Yeah. It might have been Jay Z actually. Yeah, like I, first Zero, first big know. concert I ever saw was there was Rod Stewart when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, I saw him there. I've seen ZZ Top there a few times. Aerosmith there. I've seen yes. some good shows there. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. You've seen a bunch of good shows there. there. I've seen some good shows. But you're there. a live music guy. You're a live music. Yeah, guy. and that's not a great live music venue. That's the irony. no. And it was it was all right <laughs> if you up until like the 90s and then once you got past the 90s they were like <laughs> yeah it's like the mid 90s you were like there's way better venues for this because there was just not a ton of great venues before so it was not as bad early on because there wasn't better you didn't know what you were missing exactly then you figured out and what then, you were missing yeah. you're like this is not good yeah, it's like how we all, all survive by watching regular definition television. Now you play like regular <laughs> definition television for a kid. They're like, I can't even see anything. How did you watch this? It's like this is all we had, okay, uh, kid. This watching- is all we had, damn it. And we watched it, and we we knew exactly what was going on, and we saw detail. That I would admit, watching regular definition now, it is like it's. It almost hurts your eyes. Like, what the hell is all that? Watching old games and then be like, "Where's the oh. score at? Where's the score? <laughs> Where's the, the score, score up?" I need the time and the score at all times. It was like, nah, they didn't come along until later. Somebody <laughs> didn't think of that till later on, kid. That was that was a big advancement in the broadcast. It's like, you know what? We should show the score up there because the it's a bit annoying not knowing what the score is and then watching the game. Uh, there you go. Yeah, no, trust me. A lot of that stuff, I I figured. I I have like VHS tapes of my time playing at Texas. And man, it's brutal going back trying to watch it because it is just everything. I don't know. We all look big and bulky and uh, looked out of focus, but everything was out of focus, and it's hard to be able to get the detail of what was going on. Um, but hey, man, that's how that's all we had. We didn't know no better. All right, but now we do know better. Uh, and because my man Patrick with the uh, horn headlines, he'll uh, make sure that we're informed and educated on the big headlines of the day. Uh, so we'll get that coming up here momentarily. We're gonna hear from Stephen Jones. He spoke to the media for the first time since free agency or the, the start of the new, the new uh, league year. And I'm not sure. Hey, we wasn't South by Southwest for a panel. I'm not sure if these comments are in Austin or if they're in Dallas, but he's talking about the Cowboys free agency period. He talks about Dak Prescott. He even talks about the frustration of the fans.
hands. Uh, we're probably going to start with that cut from Stephen Jones. Uh, we'll get into that. And also uh, we'll have Raj rant of the day coming up a little bit later on here in this segment. But before we get started and before we hear from Stephen Jones, uh, let's get into the horn headlines very quickly from my man, Patrick Davis. All right. Your horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The Houston Texans signed their new running back Joe Mixon to a contract extension yesterday. The new contract is for three years and $27 million with a reported $13 million in guaranteed money. Mixon, who turns, who will turn 28 in July, spent the first seven years of his career in Cincinnati and was a pro bowler in 2021. The Mavericks lost last night to the Oklahoma City Thunder 126 to 119 in a game that Luka Doncic missed due to soreness in his left hamstring. He will be reevaluated this weekend. And Jalen Green scored a season high 37 points to help the Rockets beat the Wizards 135 to 119. The Rockets are now just three and a half games back from Golden State for the 10th, the 10th seed and final play in spots. Elsewhere in the NBA, the Spurs play their first of two games at the Moody Center tonight as they welcome the defending champion Nuggets to Austin and then face the Brooklyn Nets on Sunday. This marks the second year the Spurs have played home games in Austin in an attempt to connect to fans in the city just down I-35. Texas softball finish off BYU in the opening game of the weekend series by run rule uh, in the fifth, 13-0. Mag Morgan picked up the win, pitching all five innings and only allowing one hit. And Texas baseball starts their series with Washington tonight at Dishwalk Field. Texas will send LeBaron Johnson and Cody Howard to the mound on Friday and Saturday, but are waiting to make the decision on Sunday starter. Texas bullpen showed improvement in their series last weekend, and Coach David Pierce will look to get the same improvement from the starters against the Huskies team that has struggled to score at points this season. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the uh, horn headlines. Uh, we'll get to uh, Rod's rant of the day coming up here a little bit later on in this segment. But let's hear from Stephen Jones. Uh, Stephen Jones spoke to the media. Uh, first media availability since the start of the, uh, the new uh, year, the new league uh, the league year, I should say, in the NFL. And he spoke about uh, Dak Prescott's contract negotiations, um, the status of those. He spoke about the NFL free agency, I would say, philosophy of the Cowboys, which is, I think, frustrating uh, Cowboys fans a little bit. He also talked about the running back market. Uh, so let's hear from Stephen Jones. The first cut is him talking about the uh, the all-in philosophy. Just, they've been asked about this a number of times, and the frustration – from Cowboys fans about the lack of initiative and the lack of moves, the lack of urgency from the Cowboys in the free agency, which has really always been the case. But it seems like this year, maybe that all in comment had Cowboys fans thinking the Cowboys may approach this offseason a little bit differently. They did not. So uh, here's Stephen Jones uh, talking about the uh, the Cowboys, uh, I'd like say the miscommunication to the fans about what all in meant and their approach to free agency. I mean, that's everybody certainly has that right. I mean, we, uh, you know, I know where the frustration is, the fact that we haven't uh, had success in the playoffs uh, to their satisfaction. Until we do that, then, uh, you know, the criticism uh, is certainly uh, uh, something that's going to be there. And we know that's going to be there, but uh, we're going to stick with what we believe will ultimately uh, get us a championship uh, here for our fans. But, uh, uh, you know, we don't define all in as what you sp uh, spend in free agency. It's keeping, you know, the core, keeping some of the great players in this league, like Dak Prescott, like uh, C.D. Lamb, like Micah Parsons, like Diggs. Uh, you know, that's what we define as all in. As I like that. Uh, is that Hall of Oates in the background? I know. It has to yeah. be South by, right? Hall of Oates is playing in the background. It's got to be. <laughs> Don't you know? It actually fit too. It was really comforting in the background. I like that. Yeah, uh, all, yeah of, so all of the Jones's press conferences <laughs> need like yacht yeah, rock behind them just to yeah. calm people down. That's a great idea. That's a great <laughs> idea, Patrick. And it could be something you do uh, like it, subtly, like discreetly yeah. in the background. And it may like subconsciously, it may just soothe because all knows is soothing. Yacht rock yeah. is soothing. Yeah. So maybe you're right. Maybe, Jerry no matter Jones, what they're saying. When Jerry Jones is explaining why. <laughs> Why they? Why they're not? Uh, why they're extending Mike McCarthy? And you're sitting in the background. You're like, do you like pina coladas? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, Jerry. Right? Just, <laughs> yeah, we're good. Everybody's like, you know what, man? I think Jerry makes some sense. I think you know what, <laughs> the Cowboys. I got a feeling that the Cowboys are gonna do good this year. Yeah, it's all because of the yacht rock, man. Yacht rock. Oh, uh, that's great. That is fantastic. I honestly, Patrick, I think you're on to something. That's why we call you the idea you know. <laughs> Okay, let's hear from Stephen Jones uh, talking about their plan in free agency going forward. Um, we just heard his definition of all in. They're all in. It's not 
capitalizing on the free agent market. Um, but let's hear from Stephen Jones about what the actual plan in free agency for the Cowboys is this offseason. I don't look at it as the next few weeks. I look at it as, you know, all the way up and up and through the season in terms of, uh, you know, how we continue to address this. And, you know, just as we all see that first day, uh, first negotiating day, uh, you know, it's, it's wild and it's and it's big, big, big dollars. And uh, uh, but then, uh, as you see now, things are calming down and, uh, you know, that's where we think, uh, you know, you can be efficient and, and do do good things. I think we have in the past, and whether it's via a trade or whether it's via just a, uh, like we did yesterday with uh, Kendricks. I'm sure there'll be more players released around the league uh, as people move forward and uh, work with, within their cap. So you never know what you might see that you don't see today. So uh, those are all things that we feel very prepared uh, to make quick decisions on and uh, I look forward to it. All right, there you go. Stephen Jones talking about the plan going forward for uh, the Dallas Cowboys in free agency, which has been the plan all along, guys. I told you guys, they don't like to participate in free agency when everybody's making it rain. That's not, they're not going to be a part of it. They sit it out in, intentionally, deliberately, and then they usually come in once the frenzy is over and they try to see what's left over in free agency. And they believe that's where you get the best value because the high dollar free agents are gone. And then they go in with the guys with the highest ceilings, but are going to give them the most value. And they, they've been, you know, like I said, that has been their philosophy for a long time. Not saying that it's always the right philosophy. I think every now and then um, you need to change it up as a franchise and as an organization. Um, but for the most part, that is how the Cowboys operate <laughs> and you know i think for the cowboys this particular offseason they have even less flexibility because they don't have salary cap space really yeah they 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 used them in, in years where they've had some salary cap space i can see a lot of frustration like man you guys got 20 million dollars in cap space let's go let's let's make a move they don't really have any flexibility they got to be extremely creative patrick in maneuvering the salary cap right now i do like that it was he basically said no no this will go all the way to the playoffs like how how do you expect <laughs> to add to this team week 18 man come on like i i get you're saying uh, hey don't judge us until we lose in the playoffs inevitably again i get that's what you're saying and then we'll say well don't worry next year will be better but <laughs> come on you can't you can't say you can't ju you can't give a final grade on us until we've left school <laughs> you, have to, you have to sometimes do it in class. And so, you know, you can, I get it. He's learning from his dad how to talk around issues in weird ways. But yes, exactly I, I agree doing. that there's going to be players available that you, they can make moves and they can make trades. We talked about, you know, the possibility of them calling up the Texans and trying to get Damian Pierce. I think there's going to be players like that across the league. That they can try and go get it running back or other positions like that. But at the same point, you can't, you can't yeah. get, look at me straight face and go, no, it'll work out. It'll no, it, of course it'll work out. I mean, it hasn't so far, but it will now, because now we're doing things. We're we're in a worse position we were in financially than we were been the last few years. So clearly it'll work out now. <laughs> that no, that I'm theory on it, I'm not I'm not going to buy from him. No, because hope is not a strategy, and sometimes no. the Cowboys kind of go into the off season with uh, we hope this will work out or that'll work out, and it's like no, man, you can't you can't hope something's going to work out. You need to have a contingency plan. You need to assume the worst at times, right? Plan for the worst, hope for the best, but then plan for the worst as a GM. And I don't know if the Cowboys do that enough. I, uh, I will just talking about. I, I will sorry, mention too, Leonard Skinner does not work as well. <laughs> in the background. No, it did not work as well. <laughs> I guess I think no, I think the Yacht Rock was perfect. The Yacht Rock I think Leonard about Skinner, Rock, too man. aggressive, too aggressive. Yeah, the Yacht Rock, it is something soothing <laughs> about Yacht Rock. You got Yacht Rock on the background. I mean, everybody can do that. You feel like Yacht at brunch or something like that. So I, I'm with you. I think the Yacht Rock it made me, it put me at ease. Yeah. That's all I noticed. I was like, damn, why am I so calm listening to Steven? I was about to go on a little rant. Oh, it's the Holly Notes in the background. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh so continue with that. Uh all right. Um Steven was also asked about the running back situation, which for the Cowboys right now is dire. I mean, they don't really have a running back right now at all. And AJ Dillon reportedly is going to resign with the Packers. That's a report that's out there now that he's going to end up resigning with the Packers. And remember, there was supposed to be mutual interest between AJ Dillon and the Cowboys. What the hell are the Cowboys going to do at running back? Stephen Jones was asked about it. Here is Stephen Jones's response. You know, I think we're having to make some tough decisions right now. Obviously, I mean, it's an organization that's uh, 
uh, been built on great backs, whether it's a Tony Dorsett, a, a Herschel Walker, an Emmett Smith, a, a Zeke Elliott, a Tony Pollard. Uh, you know, we, we've been big believers in the backs. And they, uh, they bring a lot to the table. Unfortunately, we're at a point where we're having to make some some decisions and uh, in terms of where we allocate dollars. We allocate dollars to a guy, you know, like a Kendricks who could come in and help in an area where we felt like we were short. And, you know, we feel like there's some ways, going to be some ways that we can address the running back situation in a more efficient way. But uh, uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, a lot to be played out between now and the first game next year. I don't think you win a, a Super Bowl championship, uh, you know, on the first, second, third day of the league year. Um, and to that point about the running back position, Derrick Henry recently signed with Baltimore. Um, and Baltimore's been trying to get Derrick Henry for a while, just uh, throwing it out there. They tried to trade for him last year. didn't work out. I ended up getting him via free agency. He was on um, a Mad Dog Sports Radio recently. And he was asked about the Cowboys and whether the Cowboys expressed any interest in him during his free agency. Derrick Henry's comments have a lot of Cowboys fans a little upset and the Cowboys weren't doing their due diligence about Derrick Henry. Here is uh, Derrick Henry on Mad Dog Sports Radio. You know, I have said Baltimore for you. I've also said Dallas, you know, during the trade deadline and then during free agency. And you obviously sign in Baltimore. Did Dallas pick up the phone? Were they involved in the Derrick Henry sweepstakes? Uh, Dallas didn't even no, not not at all. Um, uh, I'm not. I, I don't really know what uh what's going on over there. And um, but you know they weren't making ten. Um, uh, Baltimore uh was showing the most interest, and you know somewhere I wanted to be. I was glad that um we got it done, but the Cowboys never called at all. Wow. Never even picked up the phone. Now, were they on your radar as you're going through the process? Or did that surprise you? I'm I'm stunned hearing that, that the Cowboys never even picked up the phone. Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, because, I mean, that's why, I, that's why I stay in the offseason. And, um, you know, uh, kind of on the, on, the, on the back end of my career, um, that's a, a great uh, organization. And, um, uh and uh, um, I mean, it's been, been a great opportunity, but I'm thankful that I ended up here in Baltimore, somewhere I wanted to be, somewhere that um, they 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 wanted me here as well. And um, like it's a perfect match, and I'm excited. This is exciting time for me and my family, and um, you know, just, but, just ready uh, to get to work. That's my that's Derek Henry saying Cowboys never reached out at all. Now, they probably didn't reach out because they assumed the price tag was too much. As we talked about, Patrick, the Cowboys weren't willing to pay, what was it, upwards of five, four to $5 million um, for uh, a running back on the free agent market. Uh, that, that that price tag may have been a little too much for them. If that's the case, then Derrick Henry definitely was going to be way out of their, you know, right, uh, out of their budget, I should say. Yeah, I think he was going to be. But the, the other issue with that is, even if he's out of your price range, you make the phone call. You make the call. You make the call and you say, hey, we're looking and we just want to get a price. You know, what are you looking at? What are your other offers? And and uh, and they say, well, we're looking at we want to get 10 a year. And you go, OK, we're not we're not in the ballpark for 10. Uh, we appreciate your time. We're, we're going to be a little bit lower than that. If you'd like to talk to us further, our phone lines are open. Hit me up. Uh, but we'd yeah. be more in the five, four to five range. Uh, is what we're looking to pay. So if you want to come take a pay cut to come play for Jerry and come play in Dallas, great. Come on down. But uh, otherwise, we can't be in. But you just make the phone call. You say, look, we get it. We Best of luck to you. But you pick up the phone. I would have been I calling agree. every single agent there was and being like, hey, let's let's talk because, you know, you don't know who you meet. And someone goes, my dream is to play for the Cowboys. And I'll take a pay oh, cut. And even, if, and even if you said, well, we only really want to allocate three to four. And – you get somebody who's, you know, a Josh Jacobs, and he says, I'll take five. You go, it's one more, but we're getting a young running back who could possibly be the guy. Okay, well, we'll pay five a year for you. But, and I don't think that's going to happen, but at least you pick up the phone. I agree. It takes, what, five minutes? Hey, what's the, what, what's your client asking for? He's asking for 10. All right, we, we're probably in the four or five range. So thank you, man. We appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah I'm with you because he said he lives there in the offseason. So, you know, you never know. Sometimes guys just want to get close to, to home, close to a family member. 
I, I couldn't believe when you said, no, they didn't reach out at all. That's if you're a Cowboys fan. You got to be disappointed in that. You, and it's just like, it's like a friend of yours. You're going out a single friend of yours, you know, saying that, you know, Hey man, that, that, that chick is out of my league. So I'm not even going to go over and talk to her. It's like, well, dude, she, I mean, well, she's out of your league. You never know. Get on over them. I see, <laughs> I see dude. I see dudes who I'll kick their coverage all the time. I see ugly dudes with beautiful women all the damn time. You never know. You know what I mean? She may she may like your game. She may like your swag. Whatever it is, you need to go over there and holler at her if she just, you know, totally shuts you down and declines your, you know, your advances. That's okay. But, man, you got to go over there and at least talk to her. If, if you're into it, go talk to her. That was always uh-huh. my strategy. And I was shocked sometimes that, hey, oh, you know what? The dime piece, actually, she's reciprocating my, my vibes here. She likes it. You never know. You never know. You got to yeah. go check it out. I'm with you. Make them tell you no. Make them tell you no. no. And I mean, and you know, it's I, he, we had the AJ Dillon that we thought AJ Dillon could have been the guy, and okay, he maybe's in the range, but it, I don't know if they never picked up the phone on him or if they did and they just lowballed him and he said, "Screw it, I'm going back to Green Bay." You know, better to be with the person you know than than take the unknown. I don't, I don't know what that was, but yeah, you love to be able to get a straight answer, which you never will out of the Joneses to be like, how many running backs did you call? Oh, here's a list of 15 running backs that are good enough to be a starter on an NFL team that were available. How many of them did you call? Seriously. Because if it's zero, that's malpractice. Yeah. And if it's, if it's five, we can talk, but if it's zero that you didn't even pick up the phone to see, and you said, hopefully we'll just wait it out and then someone will get cut and there's no more teams available. And that's when we swoop in and pick up the sloppy seconds of the NFL. And that's how we'll win a title. No, that's not how you win. That's what the legal tampering period is for. Yes. It's for you to start reaching out to agents and getting a feeling out process. And now it's past feeling out. Now teams are just saying, screw it. We're just going to be straight up tampering during legal tampering period. Uh, it's supposed to be ironic, guys. It, it's, it's, the, it's an ironic title. It's not, you don't actually, t- tampering is not actually legal. They just call it that. Uh, but anyway, the Cowboys, yeah, they're supposed to be hitting up agents like, hey, man. Um, Derrick Henry, you know, we, we know that he might be asking for a dollar figure. Any chance he's willing to take five with the Cowboys, you know, because we can offer him incentives and this and this and that, whatever it may be. Um, so I hope they I'm, – I'm pretty sure they are doing that. I think they figured he was just out of their league, and they probably did it with some other backs. But I'm with you. Why not start at the top and then just kind of work your way down? <laughs> with the tie back. So, all right. So, we'll get into some more Cowboys session. I still haven't gotten to Jordan Lewis. So, we'll do that on the other side. They did re sign Jordan Lewis to a fully guaranteed one year deal. That is a brilliant move by the Dallas Cowboys to bring him back. We'll talk about why that is the case. Uh, we'll also get Raj Rant of the day on the other side. And this Aaron Rodgers story. Have you. Have you been researching this Aaron Rodgers story, Patrick? The latest. I, you know how far weird? I try and stay away from things that are going to ruin my day? It is so strange. CNN, um, I believe, is the one that broke the story or at least had the report. Um, so we'll play the CNN sound. I thought it was fake news. I was like, this is a fake This is a fake thing? Um, no, it wasn't fake news, uh, I guess. Well, maybe it is fake news. I don't know, but it's a CNN report, which we do have now, I believe, a response from Aaron Rodgers about this report. So we will discuss both of those on the other side, too. So we're going to cram a lot into the next segment. Uh, we'll do that on, on the other side of the broadcast featuring my man, Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Mohun Rod Davis coming right back on Mahon. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Yes, yes, we all hate traffic, but if you were sitting in traffic in a car that you really loved and a car that you really enjoyed, well, maybe your traffic experience would not be so miserable. So my friends at Apple Leasing can actually help you with that. So theoretically, they actually can uh, make your traffic experience a little bit better. So if you've been thinking about getting a new car, uh, how run down your car is, maybe it just doesn't fit your lifestyle anymore. Maybe it's too small. Maybe you need a bigger car. Maybe you need to downsize and get something smaller. Maybe uh, your car is a little bit 
too old. Maybe it's been giving you problems. Maybe you just want to enjoy that new car smell. Apple Leasing has the ability to put you in any make or model vehicle that you want. My friends at Apple Leasing can help you get the price you want, the payment you want on the car that you want. All it takes is a little bit of effort from you, right? Just one phone call uh, and let them know exactly uh, what your, uh, you know, exactly what you want. You let them know exactly what you uh, what what you want in an automobile, whether it be an SUV or a sedan or a truck. Uh, you let them know your specifications, what color you want. Uh, let them know what your budget is, whether you uh, are in a lease right now or whether you're not in a lease. Uh, you let them know exactly what your price point is. They will help you find the exact car for your lifestyle and for your budget. They'll give get you the most bang for your buck. Navigating the car industry can be really tough. It can be really stressful. It can be very time consuming. Going to different dealerships, uh, doing the price shopping yourself, vetting all the dealers, vetting the salespeople to make sure that you can trust them spending uh, that kind of money. Also going down the rabbit hole, right? Researching the automobile to make sure it's the right automobile for your budget and for your lifestyle. Those can be really time consuming tasks. They can be really, really stressful tasks. You want to take that stress out of the process for you. All you got to do is reach out to my friends at Apple Leasing. Like I said, they can get you uh, the price you want, the payment you want on the car you want. They'll get you a quote on any make or model vehicle that you want. They can even give you an estimate on the value of your trade in right over the phone. They have what they call a simple interest, easy lease, which is going to make things well simple and easy for you, give you more flexibility, which is going to give you more possibilities and options to help you find the vehicle that fits you best, but more importantly, the vehicle that fits your budget best. Everything seems of a price. That's why leasing makes more sense than ever. You're only paying for the part of the car you're actually using. So give them a call, 512-346-9977. That's 512-346-9977. Or visit appleleasing.com. That's appleleasing.com.
back to the Rodcast. Time for Rod's rant of the day. Now, free agency, I've talked about this. If you're looking at it as a long-term strategy of building a roster, uh, it that's flawed logic, right? You're gonna most of the, the time. Um, you're going to end up kind of spending yourself into oblivion <laughs> um, and you're not going to get the return on investment because that is the worst talent acquisition value in the NFL. The undrafted free agency, best value. The draft is the next best value. Trades are a better value. It's the worst talent acquisition um, in terms of the, the value. It's the worst way to acquire talent and build a roster, but it's a great way to supplement a roster. And but my theory is, and I got some evidence to back it up. That, and my theory is that as the salary cap continues to grow, the more and more robust the NFL salary cap becomes. If you are the biggest spenders, like the biggest spenders in free agency, you can see some immediate return on your investment. Like you, you can win. It can lead to you winning more games right away. Long term you like I said, you'll spend yourself into oblivion and, and you won't get the return on that investment. But I, I will say short term, lately, since the salary cap has started to increase uh, exponentially, you're starting to see more teams get immediate return on that investment. Now, the team that has spent the most money in free agency really over the last 10 years has been the Jaguars. And the Jaguars also have the most losses in that time span, too. They've lost a lot of games in that time span. And I think the Bucks and the Jets, sorry, sorry, the Browns and the Jets are also in that category. Um, but the teams who have been the most successful in that time spent over the last 10 years, the Patriots, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Green Bay Packers, the Seattle Seahawks, they are below average spending in the last 10 years in free agency because free agency, like I said, long-term building, it's not really conducive to long-term success. Like it's not going to be sustainable for you. Um, but like I said, in the the big butt there is, right, in the last seven, eight years, you've seen teams who are the biggest spenders in free agency actually have immediate success. Um, go look at the uh, 2023 Denver Broncos. They were the biggest spender in free agency, and they won three more games in the previous year. Uh, Jacksonville Jaguars in 2022 were the biggest spenders uh, in that season, and they won six more games than they won the previous year and make the playoffs. The Patriots in 2021 uh, were the biggest spenders. They won three more games in the previous year. They made the playoffs 2020. It was the Dolphins. They had five more wins in the previous year. Not a playoff team. Jets in 2019 won three more games as the biggest spenders. They did not make the playoffs 2018. It was the Bears. They ended up making the playoffs um, winning seven more games than they did the previous year at the biggest spenders. Uh, 2017, uh, the Jags won seven more games and made the playoffs as the biggest spenders. 2016, the Giants won five more games and made the playoffs as they were the, now they were the biggest spenders. They spent well over, you know, a hundred million dollars. So we're talking about the top of the, the free agency spenders. Um, so it's, we haven't done like the top five. I'm still working on that, but I will say the, the teams that decide to make it rain the most, they do see immediate return. And the reason it started in 2016 for that, you know, most of the teams who spent big in free agency, uh, they were losers. All right. They were the biggest losers in the regular season. Um, the teams this year were the biggest spenders of the Falcons the Titans, the Panthers, the Vikings, the Commanders, and the Raiders. The Falcons, Titans, and the Panthers have all spent over $200 million so far in NFL free agency. And none of these teams are playoff teams, right? So uh, we'll see how much they improve. We'll see if the Falcons, who are the biggest spenders, they improve. They got the Kirk Cousins still in place. That's where most of that money is. They've spent $231 million on just three players. The hell, the Washington Commanders have spent 143 million on 13 players. Talk about getting more bang for your buck. They're overhauling the whole damn roster. The Titans, um, they got 10 players and they spent 221 million. So my point is that when you go, if you go back to 2016, that's that that actually is the largest salary cap increase. When I think this trend started of the biggest spenders seeing immediate return on their investment. And why teams have been encouraged to spend more in 2016, you saw the largest increase percentage wise uh, in this in salary cap uh, growth in 2016. It, it was an 8.3 percent increase. That was the largest since 2006. 
In 2006, that was a 19% increase. Um, that was them kind of restructuring the uh, restructuring the salary cap at that time. But that was the largest increase prior to the 8.3% increase, um, which has been the largest since the post-COVID uh, salary cap increase. And they did that because they actually, for the first time, dropped uh, decreased the salary cap during COVID for the first time. So that 8.3% increase and it was $11.9 million increase in the salary cap. Those were the biggest in like 10 years. So the NFL, I think the GMs were incentivized to spend a little bit more money since those were the really, really big, um, uh, really big increase in the salary cap. And since then we've seen similar increases. Um, and now, like I said, you may end up getting, you just this past season had the largest increase in the history of the NFL. The belief is that in salary cap, uh, history, the belief is that they're going to continue to increase. I think it was like 30 plus million dollars uh, that it increased this past season. And that's going to continue to increase that much with the new streaming rights, with the new broadcast deals and with gambling now being also a part of the overall revenue of the NFL. So, you, this this pattern of being the biggest spenders in free agency and seeing immediate returns that may actually continue, um, but still not a great long term uh, investment for teams in terms of roster construction. But fans don't give a damn about that. All right. They want to win right now. And if it leads to four more wins for you to have to spend two hundred million dollars, you know, the fans would like to see that. Yeah. All right. So there you go. That's the uh, that's the, the the trend that's starting to develop in the NFL. With the big spenders. Yeah. No, and, and that's, I think, you know, it's that, that fine line in, in the middle of you don't have to be the biggest spender, but you got yeah, to spend some. You got to spend some. You, you can't, you right. know, there's a difference yeah. between the guy who takes a girl out to a five star restaurant and the guy <laughs> who takes to, to an Applebee's. Yeah. And then there's the guy <laughs> who goes and says, let's go get the day old bread. And they, they throw the, you know, they throw the bagels out after a day. They throw the good, they're still good. <laughs> Still and the good. Cowboys right now are like, the bagels are still good. They're, they're just, they good. can't Why sell them it? anymore. So we're taking that. Be like, just Applebee's, Cowboys. Applebee's is fine. Applebee's is, is quality. And wrong it's with fine that, with man. Applebee's. Wrong with them. Apt- we're cool with, appetizers with there. TGF Fridays. Take me to Chili's, Cowboys. Something, but we just can't. The day old bagels. That's where we're at right mm. now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they, they on the verge of being cheap. There's a difference between being shrewd, yeah. being frugal, and being cheap. The Kansas City Chiefs are actually shrewd because they're cheap, but it's effective. So when you're cheap and it's effective, they call it shrewd. All right. <laughs> when you're just when I think you're just looking at cost effective ways, I'll say that's frugality. The Cowboys on the verge is being cheap. Y'all ain't frugal. Yeah. Y'all ain't shrewd. You're just being cheap now. No, and that may be the case. Yeah, and nobody likes cheap billionaires. It's that. Yeah, because it goes down to the end of the day. Jerry Jones can say all he wants about how all these players have to give team friendly deals for the Cowboys to be able to compete. The reality is if he wanted to put his own money up and take the own hit in the pocketbook and go cash over cap and do all these other tricks you can, you can spend more money. It takes cash out of your pocket to do it, but he ain't willing to do that either. Uh, Speaking of the Cowboys, they did re-sign Jordan Lewis. I want to throw that out there to a one-year deal. Fully guaranteed deal. Eighth year with the Cowboys. So the organization just really likes him. Um, By the way, so now their corners are Trevon Diggs, Deron Bland, and Jordan Lewis. Uh, I think that's a good group of corners. They need to sign Stephon Gilmore. He may give them a hometown discount. Here's audio of him on the fan uh, on 105.3, I believe, uh, earlier this year talking about the Cowboys and possibly uh, giving them a hometown discount. Stefan, uh, what's your approach to free agency? Are, would free agency, do you prefer to be back with the Cowboys? For sure. I mean, I want to be back and, you know, because I think, I for sure think we have the pieces to beat it, get get to where we want to be, and I want to be part of that. And, um, you know, so March start, March is when free agency starts, so. He got to come back with his bro. Hopefully we can get something done. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. He, he can, Let's make yeah, it happen. I need, I need him back. Yeah, I, I want to run it back with, yeah. you know, uh, B. Cooks, you know, all these guys, great players on the team. Have an opportunity to play with Bland another year and yes. Trey coming back off yes. ACL. Yes. So nice job with that. Yeah. Three of you, by the way. Yeah. Bland's even dressing yeah. like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Watch your practice. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. It's yeah, two, yeah, two the same guys. So there you go. He's saying he wants to come back. They need to bring him back. Listen, I love Jordan Lewis. Jordan Lewis is great. The reason the Cowboys love Jordan Lewis is he's coming back for his eighth year. He has always outperformed his contract. 
That's why they love him. Yep. His rookie deal, he, he was getting paid 800 some thousand dollars a year and yet ended up uh, through his uh, rookie contract, four interceptions, 17 PBUs, four force, uh, four fumble recoveries, four sacks, four QB hits, two tackles, for, six tackles for loss, excuse me. And then when he got his new deal with the Cowboys, getting paid four mil a year, still ended up through that contract, five interceptions, four forced fumbles, four fumble recoveries, 17 pass deflections, two and a half sacks. He always outperforms his contract. He is cost effective for the Cowboys. So they're going to bring him back. And he's a, they need him. Because they have, they got obviously they they get they need somebody that can play the slot. He really can, but he also can play outside. If they need him to manufacture depth, but they also need to make sure they prioritize bringing back Stephon Gilmore um, because he's he's a stabilizing force. They got a lot of ball hawks in that secondary. Jordan Lewis being one of them, Trevon Diggs and Deron Bland. They need someone who can provide some balance in that secondary. Uh, too many guys who are risk takers who want to roll the dice. Dan Quinn loved that, by the way, because he was a riverboat gambler. Um, but you need somebody in there who's a bit more stable um, and doesn't gamble as much. They're just consistent, and that is Stefan Gilmore. But Jordan Lewis, final four games of the season, guys, he had a higher pro football focus grade than LeJarrius Sneed and Jalen Johnson. I mean, he was he was the, basically the best – D, the best cornerback for the Cowboys, if you look at the final four games of the season and looking at his pro football focus grade. So a uh, good move for the Cowboys. Uh, really good move. All right. Uh, we come back. We'll get into what the facts, what the stats. Uh, we're also going to get back to the we'll, we'll get to this Aaron Rodgers story. I promise you. It's a weird story. It's strange. Uh, and I don't, he, this, the stories are getting weirder and weirder that surround uh, Aaron Rodgers that are about Aaron Rodgers. So we'll get to that. But we got what the facts on the other side, basketball related factoids that I want to break down for my man, Patrick, when we come back. All of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long Run Rod Babers coming right back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Uh, we just had uh, Charlie Wilson on earlier this week, uh, the general manager and the CEO over at Callahan's, and he's giving him some great uh, lawn care tips, trying to uh, help me out, get the weeds out of my yard, trying to get it to be that uh, that golf course uh, caliber uh, green grass out there to make sure I have the, the lawn of the month in the neighborhood. That's my goal. I want to have the best yard in the neighborhood, and my friends at Callahan's can help me out with that. They can help you out with that as well. Easter arrives early this year, so be sure to check out all the other uh, baby chicks and ducklings and, and rabbits that are going to be at Callahan General Store. But when you're out there, you can pick up all the uh, the feed, food, and supplies you need for your animals, but also you can pick up all of the lawn care equipment that you need as well. Now, the spring has arrived, so Callahan's can help you uh, get your lawn in that golf course condition. That's what I'm trying to do. I want to make it look real nice. Did some yard work yesterday, and courtesy of my man, uh, my man Charlie Wilson, I knew exactly what to get. Got the pre-emergence down. Uh, we're going to get the weed and feed down coming up a little bit later on next week. And now that spring arrives, uh, you want to make sure that Callahan's can help you out, uh, get your lawn in perfect condition. In the next few weeks, uh, you get your weed and feed down. You can grow the good grass and keep the crab grass and the dandelions out of your yard. Uh, and as nighttime temperatures rise close to the mid highs in the 60s, you'll get your Bermuda seed down there to cover all those spots that got burned out and damaged during the summer. So these are all the tips you get at Callahan's. You can go there. They have uh, fine professionals that will help you out answer all your questions to help you with your lawn care needs so folks don't forget it's also time to begin uh, planting those seedling vegetables uh, and all your uh, garden uh, garden flowers and you can also get that at Callahan's and they can help you out with that as well uh, they can give you all of the knowledge you need to make uh, all your friends uh, believe you have that green thumb I don't have a green thumb but I do have Callahan's and so do you so uh, find a way to make it a Callahan's day they're still there off a of 501 Bastrop Highway between downtown and airport Make it a Callahan's day.
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. I'll be quick here, but so we can try to stay on time. Uh, so, how about this, Patrick? Uh, something happened Wednesday night in the NBA um, that was wild and unprecedented. It, the Cleveland Cavaliers didn't take a free throw in the first three quarters of their game against New Orleans. Uh, it marked the first time this season that a team, any team, entered the fourth quarter without a free throw attempt. Uh, or at least, uh, it basically a free throw attempt at all. About 2,000 NBA games have been played since the last time it happened. Um, then the same night, it happened again. <laughs> Memphis uh, was playing a game against Charlotte, and Charlotte's first free throw against Memphis came at the 10-13 mark in the fourth quarter. And basically that came a few ticks earlier than the Cavs first free throw attempt against New Orleans, which came at the nine minute mark in the fourth quarter. The Cavs finished the game with just three free throws, the team's lowest total since 1994. And now there is talk about this. I don't know if it's a conspiracy, but it's a trend in the NBA. And maybe that's a conspiracy behind it, that the Swifts are swallowing their whistles. Shooting fouls are down to the lowest uh, number. If you look at a month-to-month, look at whistles per 100 possessions. Uh, this is basically the quietest month of the season because shooting fouls are down uh, to, to 9.4 uh, in terms of month-to-month comparison. Non-shooting fouls are down 9.3. Technical fouls uh, 0.62. That is also the lowest uh, number of any month this season. Defense of three seconds down to the lowest total this season. Uh, travels as well. Just they're just not calling a lot of calls in NBA. You watch more NBA than anybody I know. I know you've noticed it. What's your conspiracy theory behind it? Uh, they wanted the game to look be better. They wanted uh, mm-hmm. fans to enjoy basketball again, and so they they made the rules where they should be instead of where they've been for the last couple of years. And people have been exploiting them. I love it. I'm a huge fan I like of it. it. I know the players okay. don't like it right now because every offensive player who doesn't play a lick of defense hates it. Because they still foul on the other end and they hack people and they can't play defense. And then they go on the other end and flop on the ground and wonder why they're not getting a call. But I'm a fan of it. I, I think it's okay. it's weird to do it midseason. It's weird to do it midseason. Uh, normally, that would be a change you make in the off-season. in the offseason. Yeah. And then they go, oh, the refs are calling it a different ways here. So it's a little weird to just all of a sudden come in the all-star break and they're like, hey, we realize the games are taking forever because everyone's trying to shoot 50 free throws a game. And that's not fun basketball to watch. Free throws are not fun to watch. So why don't we speed the games back up and start calling a few less fouls and people will eventually adapt to it and stop trying to draw just foul after foul by going in and, you know, not playing fun basketball, just trying to get to the free throw line. And and so I'm I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Will it continue in the playoffs is the question. Oh, yeah, it should. Again. It should. I mean, that's playoff. It should or will. You think it will? Yeah, because that's playoff. That's normally what happens in the playoffs. Okay, That's normally playoff them. basketball is they, they, they let, let them play more because you have more skilled players. And so normally when you get to the playoffs, they can do that because the level of talent and the level skill of play levels, is skill yeah. levels higher. It, it, yeah. You're just doing it now with everybody. So you, you're seeing games mm-hmm. where teams that are younger and maybe wouldn't be as good in the playoffs that would struggle in the playoffs are having those struggles now. Yeah, I get you. That's a great point. I, I, um, do, want right, to, uh, I do want to throw you one ahead. more real quick because I was Let's watching this game yesterday. Uh, that it took Florida State. Florida State uh, was playing North Carolina in the uh, ACC basketball tournament. It yeah. took them until the 31st minute of play, Florida State, to notch their 10th rebound of the game. Not offensive, 10th rebound overall. Period. Period. They ended up getting out rebounded 48 to 22 in the game. That was how bad it was in that game. The stat, they though, get, it, watching it. Injuries? No, it, but it was just <laughs> out, North Carolina out rebounding them all game. And Jay Billis is calling the game. He goes, I don't know the last time I've seen it go 30 minutes. So it's halfway through the second half of the game. They still had nine rebounds That's total. Unbelievable. Damn. I mean, I wonder if they, if they had some injuries to their front court, big men out or something like that. North I mean, Carolina is a really good basketball team, too. So. I mean, yeah, but they haven't done that to anybody else, have they? I no, mean, but I mean that's it. yeah, that was a that was a fun stat yeah. though. That's uh that to see that stat. get that's, there. 
that's a crazy stat. If you're a coach, you got to be losing your damn mind. Oh, yeah. Getting, out, getting dominated like that on the boards. Uh, all right, good stuff there in uh, what the facts, little hoops oriented, what the facts, what the stats. Uh, and I think everybody's getting a hoops mindset. March Madness, uh, you got the NBA uh, getting closer and closer to the end of the season, uh, getting ready for the postseason. They're already calling games, like my man Patrick said, like it's postseason basketball already. All right, we got to get uh, to the break. We'll come back. We'll get into some of the big headlines of the day. Uh, the Cowboys made a signing, uh, re-signing Jordan Lewis. Also, the Texans with a surprising move to extend Joe Mixon. We will get to that Aaron Rodgers audio and his retort uh, to the CNN report about Aaron Rodgers. Uh, and also, we'll go behind the burn orange curtain, talk a little Texas football, examine both sides of the ball, big questions, big concerns, all that more. When we return, a Freak Flag Friday edition, 512 Friday edition of the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Low Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
Welcome back to the Rodcast, a freak flag, feel good, fake it till you make it, Ric Flair, woo, 512 Friday edition of the Rodcast, and the 512 comes from the Idillionaire, Patrick Davis, my co-host, uh, we call him the Idillionaire because he's always coming up with great ideas, and one of them was 512 Friday, where he plays jams from local bands and artists, very talented human beings that you have a chance to see live and in person right here in the ATX, uh, who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Black Odyssey. BLK Odyssey is where you look at them online. They are playing Friday at Mohawk. Oh, I like that. Okay. Uh, and that's why I like my man Patrick is trying to find you uh, shows you can get to for free 99. That's I'm trying saying. to find you. This, I, and trying. some of them may have a small cover. I don't know. All of them, I couldn't check all of them, but they'll be playing around town. And they may be playing a free show, too. I tried to make sure I didn't get you any with wristbands. I was trying not to get yeah, you any wristband shows. Then but... he turned away. He's like, oh, nah, man. Yeah. But yeah, band. make sure to check for yourself before you go out and, you know, get out there. But Black Odyssey is an awesome band doing some big stuff. And they've been growing a lot. Uh, I've known Juwan since he's since he came to Austin. Uh, he has just been blowing up and getting better and better and killing it in Austin. So uh, they're just they're right. doing big things right now. What genre is that? Uh, oh, yeah. I I mean, I guess like Neo Soul, maybe. I don't know. I don't know exactly okay. what it would be, uh, but. I guess. Uh, that song is called uh, Funkintology. <laughs> I like that. Funkintology. Okay, I like that. Uh, all right, so we got a lot to get into. We'll uh, discuss the Texans and move to extend Joe Mixon. Uh, we'll talk about the Cowboys re-signing Jordan Lewis. That's a big move by them to a one-year deal. Uh, we'll get to those. Also, we'll go behind the burn on curve next segment, start getting you ready for Texas spring football. Uh, before we get to the horn headlines, my man Patrick Davis will get us informed and educated on the big headlines of the day. I know Patrick is really excited uh, because uh, Wimby is coming Come into town. He is the uh, the superstar from the San Antonio Spurs, number one overall pick, and seen as a generational talent. And Wimby, you know, they uh, I think they're opening up the uh, the upper deck and everything too. Oh. I don't know if it's a sellout. I haven't been I haven't seen that. You probably would know better than me because you're the biggest Spurs fan I know. Um, but I love that Wimby's coming. Time. As a matter of fact, we'll hear from uh, Draymond Green here in a second. We've got some audio that I want to I want to get Patrick's thoughts about with Wimby. Um, I've been on the Wimby bandwagon. I say he should be Defensive Player of the Year. And that was at the beginning of the season. I said that in the first month of the, I said after seeing him in like three games, I was like, yeah, he should be the Defensive <laughs> Player of the Year. And he didn't have the stats to back it up. I was just like, if he played defense like that for a, a, throughout an entire season, he's going to be the best Defensive Player in the league. And honestly, he's proven Black Tradamus to be right there. But this is what I want to talk about with Wimby because we got into this earlier because uh, he's such a I – mean, even now in his infancy as an NBA player, he makes such freakish highlight real plays. You can just go kind of surf the surf your your timeline and like kind of look up Wimby stuff, and you'll see all these highlights of him during the games doing crazy freaky stuff. And he's such an attraction. How many – athletes in the world now seriously um and i know maybe i'm missing some because of my lack of international soccer knowledge but how many athletes in the world are must see spectacles and attractions like wimby and you got to go see him live not just to watch him on tv or to yeah. see the highlights but guys and gals by the way because caitlin clark by the way is in this conversation yeah i'll throw that out there right now that if you would spend your disposable income, even though we ain't got a lot of it, when if there's an opportunity to see this athlete live, I have to do it. I have to I have to do everything I can to see. I think Wimby's in that category, and a lot of, a lot of Austinites are going to try to make their way over yeah. there the next couple of games to see him. I think LeBron has been there forever. I've never seen LeBron in person, and I, I, I there's a regret there. I gotta I would love to have done that at one point in my life. I think. You know, in the NFL, it's tough. I, I I would put Patrick Mahomes there, and I've seen Patrick Mahomes in person. I'm in the NFL. I mean, they talk about yeah, yeah. tech with Cliff Kingsbury. Some of y'all, I saw him in person. No, you didn't. You saw him in <laughs> tech. All right, no, 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 that does not count. No, 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 no. I'm talking about in the league right now as the baby goat. Uh, and I just saw him in the last Super Bowl, and it was amazing. Um, but as you pointed out earlier, that's a little different, right? Uh, the Patrick Mahomes thing. That's a little different. Uh, how many? I mean, Messi's in there. Messi's in there. Messi. Messi's there. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I think there, there's the the factor of it of the anomaly of life uh, that that is a nicer way of saying than the freak factor, but um, like genetics, genetics, yeah. where you say this person you want to see women Yama, he's he's a when when you look at it and they say seven three and you go he's not saying he's taller than that you know and <laughs> when he's bigger than that and longer than that when he's dunking 
from you know feet away from the basket and just jumping over people and dunking when he's blocking and he has what they call dad blocks now is what they're calling him where he basically well, he didn't even leave his feet well, well no where he blocks it so easily he like doesn't leave his feet, blocks it and the ball just never, he just catches the ball basically he just catches <laughs> yeah. it like, it's not a block where he's swatting it out last minute he's just his just full like, hand gets it just, and he just, just gets, gets the ball and he gets, <laughs> like because you know you talk about how important those are in a game because instead of giving the ball back to them and they get their shot you just take the ball and it's a complete turnover as opposed to a missed shot. Uh, so, mm. you know, he has those and just the, the stuff yeah. he does in the game. So when you watch LeBron, there's points of it where in his game where he does that, where he is not look like when you see him on the court, he looks superhuman. He looks like a grown man playing amongst kids. Yeah. And he's so yeah. good at what he does. Zion was supposed to be that. Uh, and he's shown moments of it this season, but he's hasn't been it overall yet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's not a lot because to mix those two together, there's people that you want to see, like seeing Steph Curry is a lot of fun because Steph Curry can hit those threes, but yeah. it's also, he's a point guard. So the size doesn't do it. If you just see him standing there, there's nothing about him standing there that makes you go, Oh my God, this guy's a, a amazing. But if you see Shaq now, you still think, Oh wow. Yeah. Like that's if that's I saw a, him in his prime. That would have been crazy. That dude out yeah. there moving that fast. Yeah, Messi's like, but Messi's you know he's normal looking dude. You wouldn't you know Messi's a he small is. guy. Messi, his Messi freak is, is just it's kind of like Steph. He's like once you see him in action, you go whoa. Well, that's I think crazy. Messi falls in the camp of you. If you saw him on the street, you'd be like, oh, what do you what do you do for a living? And he'd be <laughs> like, I am the greatest soccer player ever living. Like, no, nah, <laughs> but what do you do? Like, what do you do? That's not true. Like, I'm sure you play on the side some. So he has a yeah. flip of it where he's a smaller guy and hey, you can Holmes with his shirt off. And you say the same thing too. If you saw his shirt <laughs> off, it would be like, "You're the goat." It's like, "Yeah, I'm the goat." That's yeah, be me. Look at this, dad bod, baby. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm with you. You're right. That there's an element of just freakish, God given genetic talent, right? And that makes you an outlier. And that is also very freakish and those guys are probably the top of the list but i'm just saying there they're not many of those athletes on the planet right now no that are higher on the list than wimby there are a few of them but there ain't many and that's and that that come that attraction that spectacle is coming to moody and i would i gotta make sure at one point i go out of my way to see him and, yeah i haven't seen him live know, yet i gotta go see him live at some point yeah because i've seen I most of these guys that. in basketball I've just been to enough basketball games in my life that i've seen a lot of these guys see, yeah you, yeah I haven't seen LeBron. You seen LeBron? Yeah, I've seen LeBron several times. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, yeah, that's probably one of my regrets. Not have not getting to see LeBron. Um, He's gonna yeah, play I mean, for another what, 15, 16 years? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Until he's he, he's still pretty damn good. Bronny's gonna still retire really before LeBron good. does. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's just. <laughs> I don't see why you, we're joking. We we might be on to something. They might be going out the same year. Yeah. Um, hey, but Bron, but Bron going to make sure Bronny makes some rocks. He, he's exactly. going to have NBA on his resume somewhere. Yes, yes. That's for damn sure. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's just a conversation. I know this why Spurs fans are getting. They should be. I mean, that, that guy, he's going to be the biggest attraction at one point in sports. Uh, we just don't know when it's going to be, when it all comes together for him. But he should be defensive player of the year. I, I, I hate the argument that, oh, man, they're not winning enough games. That is ridiculous. That, is, that makes no sense. Then we're, then a defensive player of the year can only go to the best defensive player on the best team? Yeah. Then what the hell? Then it becomes what the Heisman is. Like, no, man, give it to the best defensive player in the league, which he is, by the way. Um, matter of fact, can we get this Draymond Green sound yes. ready? Because I'm going to get your thoughts about this. Because I, I – you know what it did it, when he said it, it sounded kind of wild, but now that I think about it, he might be right. Here's Draymond Green's thoughts on Wimby. Victor Wimbyama is probably a top 20 player in the NBA right now. With that skill set, with that length, with that jump shot, his jump shot is absolutely beautiful. In San Antonio, with that style, that kid, watch out. This is no stray at all. I think Chet Holmgren is a very good player. And I know there's been this comparison amongst those two, but I will tell you, I think there's a gap in between Chet Holmgren and Victor Wimbyama. Victor Wimbyama is just different. Kid is special, absolutely special. And he may win MVP of the league in like the next two years or so. All right. Agree or disagree with Draymond Green's take, both of them. Uh, top 20 player MVP in the next three years or so. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I mean, the MVP one is, you know, by circumstance a lot more. If, you know, how the Spurs build, if they get the right players in there, yeah. uh, what they can do. That one is uh, definitely a little bit more. Uh, but as far as top 20 player, 
it, it's like I was looking, I was looking in the break, and it's close. He may be top. He's top 20, 25. He's top twenty five. So it's in that level of, you know, he. I don't know if he's consistent enough this season, and he's not. He's not good enough at playing through double teams yet. So there's a couple things he needs to fix. I think next year he will definitely be top twenty. Uh, but this year there's just been a few things where a guy like a Demontis Sabonis is just a little bit more advanced in his career yeah, and just a little bit more used to the game that you can put him in clutch moments and he's just a little bit more prepared for that double team and a little bit more prepared for things than Wimby is right now. But that's saying that into missed a few games, had some injuries, had a minutes restriction, had all of that. Like there's been so many pieces of coming over in his first year here in the NBA. It's pretty impressive to be top 25. And yeah. then you say he's just, there's a couple things where teams know how to attack him properly. And when teams are able to do that, he struggles a little bit more when he figures that out. It's, it's over. It's over. And that's, so the reality is how long does it take for him to get the help around him that they can't double on him that much because they'll double and he'll just keep hitting guys. Cause he was hitting, he hits players when he gets doubled. Those guys are just missing shots when they start to hit those shots. Well, now you can't double on him or else you're giving up three. You're stopping two to get the other three. And, and so that's kind of where you're at with, with Wimby right now. I can't wait to see what they put around them after this this season in the draft. Like when they get their lottery pack, I can't wait to see what the Spurs do with it. And, and no, that's, that's going to be key. And that's they got money key. in free agency. And they, got money and they have agency. a bunch of draft well, picks they can yeah, trade. The, the, what they build around them is, is about to be really interesting because this is basically their evaluation of what's his skill set. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do we type need to, of yeah. players? Yeah, we need to have around him, and that every player is going to be essentially be complimentary to 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 Wimby to help yes. him. Oh, it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch the Spurs build. And, and the good part uh, is Wimby makes the players around him better. Yeah, where some star players, some star players, yeah, it's not yeah. necessarily that as much. I have a stat for you. Or I have a quote for you from Wimby that'll make Spurs fans happy oh, because a, Wimby is just really good. He's a really good speaker and really good at quotes. And so he said this in French. He was asked by a French reporter. Uh, basically about the defensive player of the year and contending for, uh, contending for defensive player of the year against Rudy Gobert. And this is his response was, I know that Rudy Gobert has a, a good few chance of winning it this year. And it would be deserved. Let him win it now. Because after that, it's no longer his turn. <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome quote. Let him win it now. Give it to him. Give, Give it, it to him, him now. Dan, he's done. Give it yeah. to him. Yeah. Give it to him. Because how many does Rudy Gobert have? Uh, two, I think. Get right about that. Yeah. Wait, I love, I love that. that. I, Give it to after <laughs> after this, it's not as it's no longer his turn. It's just yeah, such a great him. line. Oh, that is a fantastic line. Damn. Yeah. No. No. Man. He's uh. He's got it all. I mean, I I I, I can't even hate on it for Spurs fans. He's got it all. He's gonna be the face of the league going forward. Um, I can't hate on the face of the league, even though he is technically a rival uh, of of the Rockets. I get it. it it's something. Honestly, and I, I'm I feel. A little bit, uh, I'm grateful that that get to see him. I, I can did that actually. There will be a uh, showcase that if the Rockets are even competitive anytime soon, um, that man, hey, they're, they're rivals, competitive right now. The Rockets well, are know, competitive. Yeah, I know. They're not. They're yeah. not championship competitive. Yes, but, but the Spurs once once the Spurs get this thing rolling, they they're be accelerated. They'll be an accelerated yeah. path. The, the Rockets. And my hope is that the Rockets will at least make it interesting. When the, Spurs the, the Rockets really need to find who their yeah. star is. They just still don't know who their star player is going to be. That's fair. I agree with you on that, too. Yeah, the Rockets got a lot of issues. We don't talk to a lot of Rockets on the show because <laughs> I, I don't want to bore y'all half to death and then people will just tune us out. But the Wimby, we can talk Spurs. We can talk Wimby because Wimby is that polarizing. Everybody yeah. everybody wants to talk about Wimby, whether they love or hate him. Um, so uh, try to get out there. You brought up a great point, too. If you can't get to the Denver Nuggets game yeah. tonight, uh, Spurs, Denver Nuggets, and that makes sense, right? You got the, the reigning MVP, you got Wimby. That's a high, that's a high dollar matchup. So tickets are expensive. Tickets are more expensive for that. But on Sunday, they play the Nets without the star talent on the other side. Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, like there's decent players over there. It should be a fun game. Uh, yeah. But uh, tickets for that, for what we saw, for at least the cheapest, were about half the price of what the tickets were a week ago. Is when I looked last. Uh, so it was, it was a more a cost effective. If you just want to see Victor Wembanyama. And you just want to see the Spurs, and you don't care about the Nuggets as much. You say, I don't need to see uh, Jokic because you're paying for the Spurs and Jokic. Or you can go on Sunday oh, yeah. and pay for the Spurs. <laughs> Pretty much. That's, exactly right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's you your want, choice. Honestly, you want to pay for both. That, 
<laughs> Go that, that is that is sexy though. I mean, the, you got the MVP going up against, like I said, the future face of the league. Yeah, that's that's a sexy matchup. So that is worth the price of admission. But I'm with you. I just want to see Wimby. I just I try to, he gonna he he. It, uh, there's not a game that I've seen him in, or a, a game that I don't think he's been in. And Patrick watches more than me, of course. That he doesn't have some highlight type of play or series yeah. of plays. Yeah, he's just, exactly. Because he's because we just haven't seen somebody with that that size and that frame with his skill set that has handles and can shoot how he does. So you even something that's normal, a normal series for a player, just a really good series of getting a block and going down the other end and getting a layup. That's just something that happens usually in the NBA all the time. But when you see him do it, it's extra freaky because oh, we yeah. just haven't seen somebody like him do it before. So yeah, the pull up threes. When he just sinks oh, a pull up three, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're like, what? That he can do that? Yeah, he can do that. Uh, all right, uh, let's talk. Uh, we'll talk about the Cowboys real quickly. We'll talk about the Texans. Let's hit our horn headlines first. Then we'll come back, hit the Texan signing and the Cowboys signing, uh, and then we'll uh, get to behind the burnt orange curtain. Let's do it. All right, your horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The Houston Texans signed their new running back, Joe Mixon, to a contract extension yesterday. The new contract is for three years and $27 million, with a reported $13 million in guaranteed money. Mixon, who will turn 28 in July, spent the first seven years of his career in Cincinnati and was a pro bowler in 2021. The Mavericks lost last night to the Oklahoma City Thunder 126-119 to in a game that Luka Doncic missed due to soreness in his left hamstring. He'll be reevaluated this weekend, and Jalen Green scored a season-high 37 points to help the Rockets beat the Wizards 135-119. to The Rockets are now just three and a half games back from Golden State for that 10th seed in the final spot in the play-in. Elsewhere in the NBA, Spurs play their first of two games at the Moody Center tonight as they welcome the defending champion Nuggets to Austin and then face the Brooklyn Nets on Sunday. This marks the second year the Spurs have played home games in Austin in an attempt to connect to fans in the city just down I-35. Texas softball finished off BYU in the opening game of the weekend series by run rule in the fifth. It's 13 to zero. Mac Morgan picked up the win, pitching all five innings and only allowing one hit. Texas baseball starts their series with Washington tonight at Dish Fog Field. Texas will send LeBaron Johnson and Cody Howard to the mound on Friday and Saturday, but are waiting to make a decision on Sunday starter. Texas bullpen showed improvement in their series last weekend, and Coach David Pierce will look to get the same improvement from the starters against the Huskies team who has struggled to score at different points this season. That is your Horn Headlines. All right, let's get to this Joe Mixon uh, extension for the Texans. They end up signing to a three-year deal, uh, upwards of a value of $25.5 million, $500,000 per year in incentives. Uh, it is a front-loaded deal, $13 million in full uh, guarantees, uh, also $9 million of that fully guaranteed uh, money is in 2024. 4 million being 2025. So it is a front loaded deal. And I basically it allows them uh, some flexibility with that third year. I'll just say this. I don't really know. I can't say it's a bad move by Nick Casario because I don't really know the future. I, I don't know enough about the circumstances of why they decided to extend them. Um, I'll just say this. I, you, you definitely lost the value that you acquired in the trade getting him on the final year of that uh, that contract with the Bengals, which had him, I think, making like 5.6, something like nil a year, and getting him at a discount on the salary cap too, you lost that value that you got in the trade by extending him. He's a 27-year-old running back, and we know running backs, production usually decrease start. Basically, they peak at 27, and it decreases by 15% at 28, by 25% when they turn 29, and by 30, they're geriatric. They got a 40% uh, decrease in production levels. Now, there are outliers to that, and maybe Joe Mixon's one of those guys, uh, but that's, for the most part, the last 20 years, that's the data. So you signed an aging running back to a a you know a three-year deal, basically, it ends up being a two-year deal. And so I got no problem with that because you did front-load it, but you don't – now the value – now you're paying for the value. The whole point was to get yeah. – the to basically get him on a discount deal and then why not pay him next off season or pay or extend him later on during the season because 
then you would at least know what value he's going to give to the team, like in terms of his productivity. Now you're paying for his productivity that he had with the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> the whole point is to get him at a discounted rate. The discounted rate was through the trade. And then you would have him uh, as a starting running back for the 2024 season. And then you wouldn't have to pay him until after that. And then you can extend them, but then you're paying him for productivity that you benefited from. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. But now if he gets hurt or he doesn't get doesn't outperform the contract, you lose the value. So like I said, I'm being nitpicky, but the I guess my big criticism is well, now there's no value really in your Joe Mixon acquisition. You lost all the value now. Now you're paying for it. Yeah, it makes it so that the trade is not a super, you know, an A plus. They knocks it down to an yes. A, A minus, but it's still an A uh, of the trade. But I agree. It's I'm not an A B plus. You go B plus. plus now. I'll still go that. Well, and, 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 we'll see, and we'll see how it turns out next season. Because if he runs for 1,500, the real thing is if in three seasons he runs for 1,000 yards, then it's an A plus again. Because now. Great point. Yes. So if he, in three Great years, point. you keep him and yeah. you're paying him no guaranteed money and you your, your contract's front loaded and he's killing it then, then great. Uh, but the reality is the $13 million guaranteed makes me not worry about that as much because it means that that third year is most likely more a team option. You can cut him and not lose anything That's fair. Uh, that you're going to be. You could probably cut him next year if you really wanted to and get out of it pretty easily. The guaranteed money's not as bad. And I have to assume that there is a reason why they did this by it, by it not being a at all from the playbook of Nick Casario and how he's a general manager that whether it was a head coach, whether it was the offensive coordinator, whether it was Joe Mixon himself who said, uh, I, I'm, you know, we know that his interview basically when they asked him about the trade, he said uh, it hurt a lot that he thought he was going to finish his career in Cincinnati and to be re- and to have the whole conversation, the release news, and then to be traded. He was really not in a good place and was hurt, and he said he had to do that for a while. And then he said he was feeling better, but that's also after the news of the contract extension. So yeah. it could have been something in that effect that he may have been threatening retirement or been threatening to, you know, not show up in Houston. Or there could have been any of those factors as well of, you know, getting the news at the place you've been the last seven years said, no, we don't like you anymore. Go away. We, we got Zach Moss. <laughs> and you go, Zach Moss? Are you I mean, I can't even play with Zach Moss. And so yeah. <laughs> I, I get that there could be some of that factor in there as well. I have to imagine there was something in there because this does go against everything Nick Casario has done in the rest of his yes. career. Agreed, because he's – exactly. That's what one of the mercenary deals. He's like, no, I'm yeah. trying to get as much value as I can from this player without having to commit to them, right? I'm a, I'm a rent or rent-to-own guy, um, and I don't want to really make those – I don't know, ill-advised investments. And this is one, an investment that he didn't have to make. So you're right. I think something will come out later about uh, the motivation and the incentive. But I do, I like the acquisition. But like I said, now you lost the value in the acquisition. You still need the running back. You got your running back. Yeah. And that's great. But you lost the value. And that's what talent acquisition in the NFL is all about. It's all about extracting value from each acquisition until ultimately, you know what I'm saying, you have a, you've accumulated a ton of that of that value and that's how you kind of work with the nfl salary cap a little bit all right let me ask you this let me ask you this real quick rod if they had if joe mixon was released they signed him eight million dollars eight million a year so a little bit less money but more guaranteed would that have been better or worse just just curious and i know it's a a, a hypothetical if they say it again so if they if they the Bengals did release joe mixon instead of trading him and they went in free agency and they got him for a little bit cheaper but the guaranteed money was more would you would that be better or worse? Would you say, well, okay, so we did get him and we we got our running back, but you know we had to pay. We have to kind of guarantee a few I, more years. That uh, that then then the honestly to me it would be it'd be better because at least in free agency I know that you you know that you're going to pay top dollar okay. for players. That's the whole yeah, point, yeah. right? That's it's the worst value for teams. It's the best value for okay. players. Yeah, I got they you. get because they get overpaid, and the teams have the te- teams have to do the overpaying. But in you, you traded for them, so you got the great value, and then you gave it up. So to me, I think the free agency route would have been better because at least I understand why they got so much money guaranteed. Okay, because that oh, was well, free agency. That's how it works. Yeah, it's the it's the free market. But in the trade, you 
you had the upper hand, like you had yeah. all the leverage in the negotiation. I don't know why you just gave it away. That's all. But like I said, being nitpicky, I like what Nick Casario's done so far. Uh, Jordan Lewis, Cowboys, signed a one year, fully guaranteed deal. His eighth year with the Cowboys, that tells you a lot. That means the organization really likes him. And I'm speaking of, I think that because the reason they like him is because he always outperforms his contract. I've talked about this. He only cost him $800,000 uh, per year. Uh, through his first contract, his second contract cost him about four mil per year, uh, and he always gives them a lot of pr- productivity. Um, has a lot of splash plays. I believe he's got what nine interceptions in his career with the Cowboys. He's a ball hawk. Um, he's got you know I think uh, eight fumble recoveries, something like that, in his career with the Cowboys. So he's a guy that gets his hands on the football. They like that, and he can play outside and also play inside. Uh, we played the audio earlier of uh, Stefan Gilmore saying he would give the Cowboys a hometown discount that he wants to be a Cowboy going forward. Um, and if you look at it, they need to get him. If they can get Stefan Gilmore, and I don't know how what the price tag would be, then they would have corners like tre- corners would be Trevon Diggs, Deron Bland, Jordan Lewis, and Stefan Gilmore. You would still you would have one of the best cornerback rooms in in the NFL. Um, we still do actually. You still have a good one right now. Um, but the anticipation will be one of those guys is going to end up getting hurt, just like Jordan Lewis did uh, this last year, just like Trevon Diggs did. You just have to anticipate that, right? You plan for the worst. Uh, you hope for the best if you're a GM. Get Stephon Gilmore, and I think your secondary looks really good because you're deep at safety already. Um, and there are a lot of talks, a lot of, at least a lot of reports that. Stephen Gilmore wants to come back to the Cowboys, but I like the Jordan Lewis move. It's a, it's a, speaking of value, really good value for the Cowboys. Always outperforms his deal, and we'll see going forward. But the last four games of the season, he was basically your best cornerback. The last four games of the season, he played really, really well. Yeah, and I, I think that you know you talk about what's available and for the price to to let you allocate resources not monetarily, but on the field to help stop the run a little bit more, to have a safety be able to cheat up more uh, because you feel more secure in your secondary, to have the linebackers be able to focus more on the run game, to have you know different options to focus on run plays so you're not necessarily as worried about your defenders getting blown past. You feel a little bit more secure about your secondary. Uh, you know, Having to deal with what you have at this point for the Cowboys uh, if you can bring back a couple of cornerbacks cheaper than you can get a big name defensive tackle or somebody like that to help shore up the, the run game, you kind of have to make do with what you can do at this point. Yeah, you're right. You still got to get that interior defensive tackle. Um, you got linebacker help, and that was really good too. And how about this? Final four games of the season, um, Jordan Lewis was the number one run defending cornerback in the league. Yeah. Uh, based on pro football focus grade. So he's just a really good player. It gives you a lot of, and he, like I said, he usually is pretty cheap compared to the productivity he has on the field. Uh, also, C.J. Goodwin, uh, eighth year with the Cowboys signed. He's their special teams ace. It originally came to him as an undrafted free agent. All right, we come back. We'll go behind the burn orange curtain. We'll talk spring football, offense, defense, questions, concerns, position by position. I'll try to see what uh, I expect spring football to clarify and what I expect, what questions I expect them to answer coming up this spring. All of that and more right here uh, with the Rodcast featuring my man Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Austin is a great city. We all love it, aside from the traffic. But uh, the traffic is just part of is part of uh, here because uh, everybody wants to move to Austin, so the traffic is going to get worse. But all the other things that Austin has to offer make it such a great city: the uh, food, the culture, the uh, the people, the music, uh, all the other great events here in Austin, all the live events, all the live music, and also the iconic landmarks around town that make this city so unique and so aesthetically pleasing. 
And uh, what you may not know about those iconic landmarks, a lot of them were actually built by the hands and the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local Union 482, like the Pennybacker Bridge and D.K.R. Stadium. And right now, the folks over at Iron Workers Local Union 482 are hiring over 3,000 people. They got another big project happening right here in Central Texas. Uh, and they're hiring over 3,000 people. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. They're even offering training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. So if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or if you want a refreshing career change, maybe you want a new challenge. Maybe you want to feel valued by your employer and you're thinking about switching up professions. Uh, maybe you just uh, need a new start in your uh, professional career. How about a new start with Iron Workers Local Union 482? Like I said, right now they're offering training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program, competitive wages, competitive benefits, a pension plan. Uh, go online and go check out all of the different positions and all of the different benefits as well of uh, becoming a member of Iron Workers Local 482. Take pride in the type of teamwork and craftsmanship that helps shape the future of this great city. Just go online and apply at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org.
All right, let's get into uh, some spring football conversation. Um, I was actually talking to uh, Coach Bob Shipley. Shout out to uh, the On Texas football family. Uh, I was doing uh, football theory with Coach Shipley. As a matter of fact, Coach Shipley and I are going to be doing a um, a show, The Winning Drive, starting around 4.15 Mondays and Thursdays. Me, C.J. Vogel, and Coach Bob Shipley. So shout out, uh, just a little uh, tip and a reminder there. So we're talking about the biggest questions, concerns, um, or the biggest issues that Longhorns need to address in spring practice and win position by position. So quarterback, um, I think one of the most talked about issues is the deep ball for Texas and will the, uh, the deep ball return, especially after watching uh, the combine, watching Xavier Worthy set the record for the fastest 40 yard dash and then watching uh, A.D. Mitchell at the third fastest 40. A lot of Longhorn fans harking back to the season and thought, man, why wasn't Texas better at completing the deep ball? Quinn Ewers completed 33 percent of his passes that traveled 20 plus yards or more through the air. 76 the best in the FBS. I'll give Sark a lot of credit, uh, even though I know that deep ball was calling him. All right, Coach Steven, uh, he did not allow that to uh, really kind of wreck the game plan. Um, he decided to take the top off of defenses in other ways with some long developing intermediate routes, and he knows Quinn can complete those, and that was really, really good. Also, I think something that I think we want to see from Quinn this year is uh, Quinn get through, uh, get deeper to his progressions, but also uh, Quinn in straight drop back situations. But most people don't know about Quinn's game, or at least Sark's offense, is that Sark's offense is heavy play action. It's a heavy RPO. Um, you're talking about right now, Ewers last season led all power five quarterbacks in play action drop backs. And the, his productivity and efficiency actually drops off a lot in non play action passes. NFL scouts want to see him get deeper into his progressions, you know, but also see him win straight drop back situations because a lot of NFL on money downs, it's going to be straight drop back. And you've got to go out there and make some uh, some critical throws um, in big time situations. So for Quinn, that's it at the quarterback situation. Offensive line, there's a lot of talk about who's going to end up playing that left guard. Basically, who's your best five starting offensive lineman? First world problem. Uh, by the way, Kelvin Banks will be your left tackle. Jake Majors is your center. Uh, you'll have uh, DJ Campbell, I believe, is going to be your right guard. Uh, Cam Williams uh, probably at the right tackle. And the left guard is where you have some uncertainty. Is it going to be uh, Hayden Connor? Is it going to be Neto? Umi Zulu is, you know, they got a lot of different guys they could throw in there. Hell, Cole Hudson is another name that's come up as a guy that's cross-trained in different places. He's been the right guard for you too. I think that'll be DJ Campbell. So I think your best five is probably going to be Kevin Banks uh, at left tackle, Cam Williams at right tackle. Um, your right guard is going to be DJ Campbell. Uh, left guard, um, man, I think eh, Hayden Connor probably starts out as you know the left guard or, or possibly right now is that left guard. He could be one of those guys. And I think your center, of course, is going to be Jake Majors. you got a first world problem, though. you got a rotation of seven guys potentially at O-line uh, that can provide you with starting caliber reps. And for Texas, your O-line hadn't been this deep since the mid-2000s, since you were playing for a national title with Vince Young uh, as your quarterback. It hadn't been this deep and this talented since then. Uh, running back position, a lot of talk about who's going to share the carries, um, how they're going to divide up the carries, what is the running back uh, distribution of snaps looks like. I, I think, honestly, it'll be mostly just C, mostly C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue. I think situationally you could get uh, Savion Red thrown in there situationally, um, but I think if nobody gets hurt, and hell, you know it's football, so guys get all the time, I think it'll be a Blue and Baxter backfield and hopefully Sark is playing two backs at the same time two backs at the same time man but those two back sets that I love that pony package which is still the most effective most explosive and most efficient personnel grouping for Sark uh since he's been at, on the 40 acres hope he hope he uses it more with Jaden Blue and with CJ Baxter um, let me ask you wanna, let me ask you real ahead. quick about that uh is it still a two back set if you put Savion Red at the fullback are you counting that Two back set? Yes, that is exactly where I was going. Okay, it's also cool. the question about why Savion Red gained the 26 pounds. He could be, as I've talked about on this show a couple of times, even in uh, the uh, behind the burns curtain and on one of the Raj rants, he could be gaining weight because he could become some Frankenstein monster of a fullback, uh, maybe trying to copy the, the Kyle Juice Check model that Shano has in San Francisco with those two back sets. So, yes, I agree with that. No doubt about it. Um, wide receiver, how many wide receivers in the rotation? 
The Sark usually has a really tight circle of trust. We don't know, but this is the deepest the wide receiving core has been since he's been here. You got Bolden, you got Bond, uh, you got uh, you know Gold Matthew Golden, you got John T. Cook, you got uh, DeAndre Moore, you got a young buck like that. You got Ryan Wingo, who's a really good player. I think it's going to be five. I think it'll be four in heavy rotation. I think you'll sprinkle in some Ryan Wingo, but I think you'll be Bowden, Bond, Golden, uh, and Jonte Cook are your heavy rotation wide receivers. So, yes, I do think it expands this season. Um, tight end, I want. I think the question is, does, does 12 personnel decrease? Sark loves 12 personnel, probably runs it probably on average around 33 to 35% of his plays. He was heavy 12 personnel his first year, and those rates have decreased slowly as he has expanded his repertoire of personnel packages, playing more two-back sets, playing more uh, six O line package, big 11, big 12, uh, 11 personnel never decreases. It's always at 50%, but we've seen the 12 personnel uh, decrease and we've seen it move a little bit. And I think the reason for it is because no JT Sanders, um, but also the way he uses JT. And I think without JT Sanders, that personnel grouping will decrease just a little bit. Um, and I think the extra uh, reps uh, uh, in terms of the personnel groupings and how you divide them up will probably be given to two back sets or probably to the six O line package or maybe even to a four wide re receiver package, a 10 personnel package where you open everything up like he did at Alabama when he had those four first round wide receivers. So on offense, those are some of the questions I think you can answer defensively. Uh, it, everybody wants to know who's going to be the other defensive tackle. You got Alfred Collins, you got Vernon Bryden, you got Savea. Who's going to be the zero technique? Who can play right over the center, zero and a one technique? Uh, is it Sadir Mitchell? Is it Jure Bledsoe? Is it Aaron Bryan? Right now, nobody knows. And they got to think, figure out who that's going to be. Sadir Mitchell right now is my hope, um, but we don't know. They might end up going back to the transfer portal for that too. Uh, linebacker questions. Who's going to play the linebacker position opposite Anthony Hill? Uh, right now, Leonga LaFowle is probably the favorite, but you, it could be Benda. It could be Blackwell. Some people like Blackshire, the kid they brought in from Alabama. That's the big question because if you get a stabilizing force there at that off-ball linebacker, it allows you to move Anthony Hill around the formation. Uh, DBs, I think the question overall is will the secondary be a strength? Um, I think it will be a strength this year, mostly because your corners now can play more press coverage, which they did more of uh, in the last three games of the season than they did all year long. I think that's something they're going to do more of. And I think for the safeties, uh, the question will be about you know, the versatility of that group at safety. I do think uh, will they rotate a lot of safeties? I think they should rotate a little bit more judiciously. They can still rotate, but it, the timing of the rotation should be better. And the combinations of the rotations should be something, the combination of players should be something they account for. Like certain players play better together. They're better match uh, situation-wise. You know, Makuba maybe plays better with Derek Williams or a Phil Sami. Maybe he's better with a Taft because Taft can help him with the alignment assignment with the young player, that kind of stuff. So yeah. uh, those are the questions that I have. Any Questions you got, uh, Patrick, major questions for uh, spring football for Texas? I'm with you. I think Savion Red, I would just want to really see Savion Red. Like, I want to see him on the field moving and what he does because it's it, it feels like it could be really good. But on the flip of it, it feels like it could be nothing if you say, well, he's coming up and he's put on weight, but it's not good weight or it's not, you know, they're just kind of using him and they just want to be a battering ram, but he's not necessarily athletic enough now to do it or not. You know, he's not carrying yeah. the weight well. That I, I'm curious to see the offensive line who's trying to stand out and get that position. You talked about that. Who's the best five that you want to see? Uh, and I mean, that's I think the main ones you want to see out of that uh, linebacker core, Anthony, Anthony Hill's development, where he's at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then just, yeah, secondary in general. We're all still curious to see how that secondary starts to look in that rotation there. But we won't know that, I don't think, until we get to actual game time action next year is what that rotation is going to start to look like. If we're hearing that the wide receivers are having outstanding springs, yes. like the wide receivers look great. They're amazing. Not necessarily good for the DBs. That's true. The DBs, should, right? <laughs> it's it's, <laughs> it's, that, you know? <laughs> it's that, that, the, the, the problem with spring training. Someone's going to come off looking bad. <laughs> yes. That news, it's always glass half full, glass <laughs> half empty. It's, it's good and bad. Hey, your D-line is dominating the spring. 
damn, that's not good for the O-line, though. <laughs> hey, both so it your, depends on how you want to look at it. Glass hey, half full or glass half empty. Both your first teams are dominating. Man, we ain't got no depth. <laughs> there's always bad news with the good news in the spring yes that's why hey that's why we're here folks to just help you sift through it all right we come back we'll go off the record uh, off the record we'll we'll just play that aaron Rodgers stuff and we'll get to the aaron Rodgers story that we've been trying to get to for a while and why this freaky uh friday will won't be as freaky as other fridays we'll they will explain that all of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring patrick davis on lifetime bone horn rod babers coming right back on the horn
All right, time for off the record. So let's get to this sound uh, from CNN. Uh, Jake Tapper, I believe, is the one who came out with the report. Um, that's where I got the audio. So CNN had an exclusive report about Aaron Rodgers uh, reportedly uh, sharing conspiracy theories uh, about uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy. This uh, broke yesterday. Um, we'll, we'll read the re retort from Aaron Rodgers here in just a second, but here's the initial report from CNN. Like I thought it was fake news at first, but here's what CNN calls a uh, report about Aaron Rodgers and his conspiracy theory beliefs. In 2013, when CNN's Pamela Brown was covering the Kentucky Derby, she was introduced to Rodgers. Hearing that she was a journalist at CNN, Rodgers began attacking the news media for, quote, covering up important stories. Rogers then brought up the Sandy Hook shooting and said the news media was intentionally ignoring that the shooting wasn't real, that it was a government inside job. I remind you, the shooting, of course, was very real, very tragic. Twenty children and six adults were murdered that day. When Pamela Brown asked Aaron Rodgers for evidence of what he was talking about, Rogers then began sharing various theories that have been disproven numerous times by evidence. Rogers falsely claimed to Pamela Brown that there were men in black in the woods by the school, and he asked if she thought that was odd. Brown says that she found the entire encounter disturbing. Okay. Um, here is Aaron Rodgers' response, and this came um, like 18 hours later after that report. Quote, as I am on the record saying in the past, what happened in Sandy Hook was an absolute tragedy. I am not and have never been of the opinion that the ev the events did not take place. Again, I hope that we learn from this and other tragedies to identify the signs that will allow us to prevent unnecessary loss of life. My thoughts and prayers continue to remain with the families affected along with the entire Sandy Hook community. So he, he said, she said kind of thing where she just said, well, he's, he told me he believes that Sandy Hook you know, was – basically a hoax and he's saying i never said that don't know what you're talking about that's crazy i don't, I don't even know what that's that's a weird it, it was a strange thing to report on anyway that you're reporting on that he believes in conspiracy theories which by the way i think that's no surprise that aaron Rodgers is a conspiracy theorist uh he's entitled to believe what he wants to believe um but i guess the public endorsement of such a conspiracy theory like that a celebrity endorsement of it would make it more powerful and would give it you know, more appeal, widespread appeal. And I guess that would be irresponsible. And that's why CNN's. Yeah. And, and I awesome. think, you know, the fact that he threw the thing out that he was okay with uh, possibly going to run for run, you know, be yeah, a man. part of a political campaign or run for office that he's just getting that little bit of taste of, Hey, you probably don't want to do this. You, you probably want to stay out of that. Like we're, we, mm. we, you don't want the mm. microscope. You nope. mean you were in green Bay where they just let you do whatever you wanted. And then you go to New York and then you're going to be in politics. That is a gigantic shift in the amount of coverage you're going to be on you. Just stay out of it. Just stay away from it. Just, uh, you're right. Patrick. Uh, I remember that happened to Mark Cuban. Remember Mark Cuban was going to run yeah. for president. He was, he was popping up. And then, then that scandal happened. Like, well, at least it was revealed yeah. with the Mavericks. And I was like, damn, as soon as he said he was going to run for president, and like a scandal just come out of nowhere. <laughs> You're right. And that's why you see Trump survives because Trump is shameless. President Trump don't give a damn. He's like, hey, I got dirt like everybody else, but I don't give a damn. You know, and you gotta have that type of attitude if you're gonna just run for president because everybody's got sculptures in their closet. And if you're gonna call come a politician, you gotta be able to spin it, like like spin it like it's something good, or you gotta have no shame at all and be like, I don't give a damn, I don't care. Yeah, and that's that's why I, I could never run for office. Never run for office because my response to things would have to be like, Well, I was pretty drunk at the time, so I don't remember. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, that's not the spin. That's, that's not the spin. You gotta that's, spin it or be look. shameless about it. <laughs> but you're right. I don't know. That's why I will never be a politician either. I got no, no I got too much dirt. Hey, I'm still alive. I don't want her to, hear, her to hear about that kind of stuff. My, no, we good. My life's tough <laughs> enough now. I don't want to add to it with that nonsense. No, I'm good. No, no, we don't need that. We don't need Rod B skeletons out there smoking and hanging out and walking around. That ain't good. All right, let's keep them in the closet. All right, uh, we come back. We'll have, uh, oh, there's been a trade in the NFL. Nick Casario, I swear, every time I go on a, a, a rant about Nick Casario, he ends up changing his behavior 
And he, I, I swear he's listening to my rant. He ends up agreeing with me, at least in practice, if not doing it verbally. We'll talk about that on the other side. Texans making moves. Uh, we'll also get into why this Freak Flag Friday is not as freaky, at least in the state of Texas. All of that and more when we come back. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn. Welcome back to the Rodcast, a freak flag feel good, fake it till you make it. Ric Flair, woo! 
512 Friday edition of the broadcast. 512 uh, is the uh, creation of my man, uh, the idealionaire Patrick Davis, my co host. He came up with 512 Friday to show some love to live and local. Uh, is when he plays ba- jams from local bands and artists, very talented human beings that you have a chance to catch live here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Paul Val, awesome young guitar player. This is his new track that just came out yesterday called If You Want Blues, You Got It. Uh, he is going to be playing Sunday at the Pershing. I believe he's going to be playing Saturday at Seaboys, part of that big show there as well. But a couple places you can go check out Paul Val. There you go. Uh, all right. Thanks to my man, Patrick, for the uh, 512 Friday uh, shout outs and the, uh, the love to live and local. Also, a uh, big fat poll of the day. You can go check that out. A lot of discussion about that on the text line, 512-447-3776. Uh, let them know about the big fat poll of the day, Patrick, in case uh, they have not heard yet what the topic is. Poll of the day today is what is your favorite memory at the Irwin Center? We said since the Spurs are coming to the Moody Center, since all the action happening downtown for South by and because the the Irwin Center is being torn down very slowly and painfully is being torn down right now. uh, I thought we'd uh, reminisce on a Friday. And uh, what is your favorite memory at the Irwin Center? Send that in the text line 512-447-3776. Yeah, I don't have the favorite memory. I just had a very, very memorable, memorable very event memorable. there. Uh, yeah, and it was it was kind of it was a little sad. It was a little sad, a little humiliating and embarrassing for myself. Uh, so I'm gonna save that story. Not gonna tell it again, but it'll be on the podcast. I believe we told that in the first hour, six forty five, when he introduced the big fat poll of the day. Thanks to my man Patrick. All right. We got some NFL breaking news to discuss. Uh, we'll get to uh, Stephen Jones and talk some Dallas Cowboys here, but the Texans. I said, man, the Texans, they might be winning free agency. The Texans just made a move. Uh, so let's get, we got a breaking news sounder because this is, uh, this is breaking news. I think this is worthy of the breaking news sounder for the Texans. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, beautiful. I like that. So uh, it looks like it is official, official. The Texans have traded with the Minnesota Vikings. It's a draft trade for a draft position. Uh, Minnesota is going to get the Texans 23rd overall pick in the first round. They're also going to get the 232nd pick from the Texans and the Texans are going to get their 42nd pick. So they're going to get another the second round pick. They also get 188th pick. And then they're going to get another second round pick in 2025. Now, this is going to be a very controversial trade because not everybody's going to think this is good. Nope. So if you really like this draft class, you're going to be like, what the hell, man? 23, you could have went best talent available and got the 23rd best player. And by the way, you could be right. Now, this is a gamble. I always just say you approach the draft like you approach the lottery, right? To in order to win the lottery, you got to buy a ticket. The, the more tickets you buy, the better chance you have to win the lottery. That's the draft in a nutshell. So the better chance you have a hitting on the players if you have more picks to select more players. This is kind of that strategy. Also, this holds with the Belichickian strategy. And the, 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 the GMs and the executives, which Nick Casario was one at the time uh, of, the, of the Patriots for years, they would stockpile second round picks. Now, first of all, the Patriots didn't have great first round picks. <laughs> they were usually picking at the back of the first round. So it wasn't great, but they would stockpile second round picks um, because the, the second round picks, first of all, it's better value. Remember I told you, hey, man, you got to extract value from every acquisition. And I was a little upset that they, the Texans and Nick Casario lost value in the Joe Mixon trade. You got it in the trade, but then when you extended him, you lost some of the value that you were, you were able to extract in the trade for him. But in the Patriots' time, from I kept up with this for a while, but then I stopped. But from 2009 to 2018, uh, the Patriots accumulated more second-round picks um, more second round picks than any team in the league. They were obsessed with second round picks. Why? Because the guaranteed money that you owe players is cut in half. As soon as they come out of the first round to the second round, cut in half. And what Belichick and the Patriots know is that the NFL, a lot of the NFL evaluators are just bad at their jobs, period. You know, the, 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 the Patriots aren't great. But they're just bad. So even though there are 32 first round picks and there only may be 20, five first round grades for a team. Every team's got their own big board. Everybody's different. You can plan on, I don't know, four or five teams just screwing it up. 
they're going to screw up. They're going to draft a guy in the first round that should have been drafted in the second round. Uh, they're going to take a chance on the guy they shouldn't. They really like this guy, and we see it every year. And you go, man, I didn't think that guy was going to get drafted that high. And they would feed, they would basically capitalize on teams' miscalculations by getting guys that would essentially first round talent that would drop out of the first round into the second round and they pay half the guaranteed money for it. That to me is Nick Casario from his time with the Patriots learning. No, I got a stockpile picks number one, but the second round, that's the place for him to do it. So it is a great way to find value, but if you screw it up, right. And you don't draft the right players, then there's no point. So it, it is a risk, especially if this draft, is as deep as we all think, but the things that it's deep in quarterback, you don't need. Yeah. Offensive tackle. You don't need. Um, and you could argue receiver. That's the only one you could argue was even receiver and you could use a receiver, but I don't think they want to get a receiver in the first round. They don't, I don't think they think value wise. That's a wise investment for them considering what Nico Collins has done, what tank Dale has done. And they, did they get those guys in the first round? No. So if it's a deep wide receiver draft, some of them will still be there in the second round. Yeah. And, so and I like I like the move. I, I like the move. I like the move, too, because I think it does give you, you know, this again, you look at it and you say they probably didn't have three, 23 first round grades. So they said somebody has to fall. So, you, again, oh, you talk so about you talk about the risk of what well, we trade back. Well, there's risk of sitting there hoping the guy falls to you. And then at 22, the guy before you picks it or 21. The last guy on your first round grade picks, and now you're at 23, either trying to trade back now, and you're yeah. calling everybody desperate in, in with a time crunch, or you have to sit there at 23 and say, well, we just got to take whoever's best available now, and you know they don't really fit our system, and we don't do that. We don't know what to do with them, but we're stuck here, and we're going to do this. The flip of that is you get add more draft capital. If you see somebody that slips to 18 that you as a first a top 10 grade, Great point. you can Great trade point. back up. There's no Great rule point. that you can't trade more picks and trade back up into the first round. So this gives you more leverage of we are bored where we want to be. If everything goes to plan according to the way we think it will, we want to be in the second round. There's guys that are there. I saw my man Joe Cook posted uh, earlier. It takes you out of A.D. Mitchell. He may not have been looking at it. It takes you out of Byron Murphy, which you probably don't think is going to fall to 23. But Tavondre Sweat could be there in the second. You could say, well, we like Tavondre. We don't want to take him in the first round because we're a little worried about the weight. We're a little worried about the transition to the NFL. So we take him second. There's lower risk on our side with him, but a huge upside. So you can put in that kind of conversation. But if you really see if Byron Murphy falls to 20 and you really want Byron Murphy or if some other player falls to 20, trade right back up and go get him. That's and and, and so yeah. – I, I I like the trade because I think you're preparing for the draft you think will be there and you're giving yourselves options. If not, because now that second pick, ne the second round pick next year is just another pick in your arsenal that when you make the trade, well, now we can offer you three seconds to move up into the first and where we want to go. We can offer you that, you know, we have other things. We can offer you a first next year and this to move up to the top 10. We can make these different trades. I, I, I like it because it gives the Texans a lot of options but they are making the move in time where they're not stuck if things don't go the way they think. They're, they're, they do go the way they think, I think. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. They're following their big board. Yeah. He's saying, just like you pointed out, okay, we don't have 23 first-round grades. We got 19 first-round grades on these guys. Let's assume that every team is going to pick uh, – they have a board similar and they're yeah. going to pick the guys ahead of us. Then that means we're going to be – desperately picking a player that we don't have a first round grade on that may not even fit our system anyway. Why do that when we can trade that pick right now, get value for it. And then as you just astutely pointed out, totally agree with your brilliant uh, uh, point here that you can just trade back up. If the draft starts, it starts going a way that you did not predict uh, then just trade back up into the first round. You got draft capital to do so. Trade back up in the first round and go get your guy, which Nick Casario has also shown in history that he's not afraid to uh, be someone that manipulates the draft and is being ag very aggressive in the draft. Yeah. So I like the move. I know some people are already questioning, like, I don't like that. That's because you want the splash pick in the first round because first round picks are, are flashy and sexy. But the truth is, when you're picking at 23, that most of those guys who have that elite value could be off of your board. Um, and if that is the case, there's better value in the second round with more picks. Um, and then you're not overpaying for a player 
who doesn't have a first round grade for you, you're actually getting a guy new in the second round, potentially that you may have had a higher grade on. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I like the move. I think it gives them options. It's a good move by Nick Casario. Not everybody will agree um, because they want <laughs> the Texans to make that splash pick in the first round. The I think like they've made their splashes. They're going and they could do it again. But I think if you make it's it's the difference of do you want to make a splash or do you want to belly flop off the top board and it doesn't mean anything. It's still a splash, but it's a belly flop. It doesn't mean yeah, the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not the Great same point. thing. Great uh, point. I love that. Okay. We got some uh, Stephen Jones sound uh, that, that we're going to get to and talk Cowboys uh, as well here. Uh, we'll get to my rant of the day. Uh, but a couple of the moves that we haven't talked about that happened in free agency that I think are worthy of discussing. Um, yesterday, the Kansas City Chiefs signed Hollywood Brown to yeah, a one-year deal. Okay, so remember all the mock drafts that we had that, that we didn't have that, <laughs> that, that they had? It was Dane Brugler, it was Mel Kuyper, it was Jordan Reed, it was Lance Zerline. I mean, some of the most respected mock drafters, draft analysts out there. And they had Xavier Worthy being picked by the Kansas City Chiefs after he broke the, uh, the record 40 yard dash at the combine. And everybody, and ESPN was asking him about it. Everybody was talking about it. I mean, I believe the betting odds also had the best betting odds of him landing with the team, had him going to Kansas City. And now they've signed a player with a very similar skill set in Hollywood Brown, uh, who signed a one year, $11 million deal with him. Uh, he hasn't really worked out in Arizona. I think he had 118 receptions uh, for 1,200 total yards, 1,283 total yards, seven touchdowns there. But he did have a 1,000-yard season coming in 2021 when he played with Lamar Jackson, a real quarterback. I'm not saying he's going to be a 1,000-yard receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, but he's proven he can play in this league, so he's not some bust. Does this mean that they're out of the Xavier Worthy market? In the draft? I, not, not entirely, but probably. Probably. Uh, I mean, they could because this is a one year deal with Marquise Brown, too. They could want to draft a, a wide receiver and not put them in the pressure of making them try and be a number one in their rookie season for the chance to win a third title. They may they may think, well, we really like Xavier Worthy, but we're not going to risk putting him in there as the number one. We have no other options. You have to be the best wide receiver in the league in year one or else we don't win a three peat and we're, you know, we don't. We, we are not that team. So they, they still could uh, because it's a one year deal. It, it's not a huge. I, I mean, I will say, too, on the flip of that, the Cardinals. Come on, man. You gave up. A, you gave up a first for Hollywood Brown and a, and a third rounder two years ago. Yeah. And you just That's let crazy. him walk away. It's eleven million dollars is too much. And he's Kyler Murray's buddy. And apparently that friendship's over there. They're splitting ways. Uh, we assume they're going to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, so that's where we assume he, that's that they're going to be that new number one. But that is a that was a yeah, so that was a weird value because the Ravens yeah, come exactly. out and that's okay. The Ravens got a first rounder for oh, him. Yeah, the Ravens are like, hey man, we won on that one. We won. Yeah, Ravens <laughs> yeah. won. We, Cardinals lost. Yeah, they, <laughs> and honestly, just not look at those two organizations. Too, yeah, exactly. See more and more dis bad decisions. They they uh, they they accumulate over time for the Arizona Cardinals, and the 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 Ravens are the opposite, just making good decisions. Uh, and those also are reflected on the field. Uh, something else, also a bad. Speaking of wide receiver, kind of bad invest. The Calvin Ridley contract, four years, ninety two million dollars, uh, signed with the Titans. That's it's a weird investment. Remember, I I pointed out that no receiver had been acquired uh, a top 15 APY, which is average uh, annual uh, salary per year. So average per year in their salary, no top 15 uh, receiver in average annual salary had been acquired via free agency. He's the, he was, he was, he's the one they, he, they, I mean, he's, I think he's the ninth highest paid receiver and they acquired him via free agency. But here's the point. Is he a six, top 15? Six, huh? six highest paid he's, is what I oh, see. Oh, so this. I got it. I got Spock track and it says he's right. the it said ninth high. It said he said he's tenth in guaranteed money, ninth highest paid. I think six uh, next season. Overall. So it depends on how the calories are. Yeah. But yeah, overall you're probably at, right. Ninth uh, at, ninth spread out. At at, at twenty three million dollars. Uh but either way, he's in the top fifteen. I don't know if he's a top 15 receiver though, in terms of being a top fifteen receiver in the league. And the weird thing about the Titans is it's new leadership. They had a new GM in there. But it does reflect poorly even more on the A.J. Brown trade and makes it look even yeah. worse. Yeah. Because remember, ultimately, A.J. Brown, all he wanted was 
basically kind of a deal like that. He wanted to be paid upwards of 23, 25 million, and they didn't want to do it, so they traded AJ Brown. And yet now you end up signing Calvin Ridley to that deal. What two years later? And it's like, why didn't you just pay AJ Brown, the guy you drafted? Why didn't you just pay him that kind of money? Because he wanted to be there and he fit perfectly with what they wanted to do. And now they just that's also an organization like that. That was a bad, even now, two, three years later, it looks even worse considering the decisions that you're making at that position. I, I, I will I will give them credit in the fact that I believe they're two different general managers. Who, they no, it's, it's, it's different leadership, yeah. Jim, so it, the organization still yes like that. It, no, no, it was all, the Calvin really deal was a bad deal because Calvin Ridley's not that good. No, I agree. He's not fifty good million dollars paid that kind of money. <laughs> fifty million in guaranteed money is a lot of money to give yes. to a guy who was just suspended for an entire season two years ago, who you know is old, aging at this point, and like I, that's a lot of money to pay for a, a guy money, that, and, it's, and also in a world where wide receivers aren't getting signed left and right, it's not like the wide receiver market is blown up. They're paying him prices of two seasons ago in that wide receiver market That's exactly right right now when we just saw that no one's getting signed because everyone's waiting for the draft because there's so many wide receivers there's so many wide just receivers. wait <laughs> just wait yeah. a little bit and you were still going to be able to get a decent wide receiver i mean we saw keenan allen is now going to the bears they were able to get him over there mike williams just got released because the the chargers are having to get rid of everybody because their cap situation you could have got somebody like that but yeah, you That's you crazy. go out and get Calvin Ridley two years after trading AJ Brown or three years after, yeah, I, that was the first thing I thought. The first thing that went through my brain was, really, you guys, because they drafted uh, who's a kid out of Arkansas? They drafted that Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks. That is a a poor man's AJ Brown. So you drafted uh, another. Yeah. It's just everything about he it is. didn't make sense. You're right, and like I said, yeah, it is two general managers, but they're still making bad decisions at wide receiver. I guess a. That's a bad. That's a bad signing by them to sign Kevin really to that kind of money. So yeah, I don't understand it. Like, so they they traded AJ Brown what in twenty twenty one at the end of twenty twenty after the twenty twenty one season. So he's been in Philly for two seasons. They ultimately they should just kept AJ Brown around, but everybody's life would be a whole lot different <laughs> if they had done that. The GM probably would still be there. Remember that's why uh, initially I believe that's why they had the split there. Uh, Mike Vrabel and his GM fell out because yeah. of that trade. Yeah. And then that's why he he wanted him out. And that's why they fired the GM. And then they hired a new GM who doesn't get along with Mike Vrabel. And then Mike Vrabel's out. Oh, man. The whole, the whole trajectory of the franchise would be different. If they just kept A.J. Brown around, which ultimately what would have been the right move. But anyway, uh, OK, uh, we got Rod around the day. Let's get to Rod around the day right now. And then on the other side. Uh, we'll come back and get into uh, some of the other big headlines of the day. Let's do Raj rant of the day right now. Okay, we'll do uh, Stephen Jones audio on the other side. Stephen Jones spoke to the media for the first time since the start of the new uh, league year, and we'll hear from him talking about free agency, talking about uh, the all-in philosophy that's frustrated a lot of Cowboys fans. We'll get to that. All right, let's talk about free agency, though, uh, in the NFL. Here are the biggest spenders. This was uh, as of close of business yesterday, so something could have happened uh, overnight or this morning. As of close of business yesterday, the Falcons were the biggest spenders in free agency. We just about straight cash homie uh the falcons has spent 231 million dollars in free agency so far on three players because <laughs> most of that has been Kirk cousins uh the titans have spent 221 million i just talked about them with the calvin ridley deal uh on uh 10 players and the Panthers have spent $206 million on just six players. Uh, they're the only teams that are over $200 million uh, in money spent so far in, in free agency. Then the Vikings. Then uh, the Vikings are $147 million. Commanders at 100 The Commanders have the most bang for your buck, though. The Commanders have signed 13 players in free agency for $143 million. So they're overhauling the whole damn thing. So uh, Dan Quinn's been busy. To say at least hell, and I think a third of those guys may be cowboys. <laughs> at least not maybe a quarter of them are cowboys anyway, or former cowboys. Uh, 
Uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, they have three players they've signed for $38 million. And, and what the reason I'm bringing that up is because if, if you're the biggest spender uh, in NFL free agency, like the Falcons, there is evidence, and I, I pointed this out at the start of free agency, start of the legal tampering period, there's evidence lately that the biggest spender in free agency, we're talking about teams that got to spend upwards of 200 something million dollars um, that they have actually have experienced an a, uh, immediate bump in their win total, uh, at least since 2016. Now, prior to 2016, now, in, if you're talking long term roster construction, you can't build through free agency. It's just not cost feasible. It's not cost effective. It's not sustainable. Uh, to be able to build through free agency that way. But if you want to supplement through free agency, build through the draft and build through undrafted free agency uh, and build through the uh, trade market, that's the best way to go because those are the cheaper ways uh, to acquire talent. Um, But if you look at the team that has spent the most money in free agency over the last 10 years, it's the Jaguars. Uh, The Jaguars are also at the bottom of the the NFL when it comes to wins over the last 10 years. They're down there with the – uh, the Browns and with the Jets. But if you look at the teams that have been winning the most over the last 10 years, the, the Patriots, the Chiefs, the Packers, the Seattle Seahawks, um, they're all below the average spending uh, median in the NFL in free agency over the last 10 years. And because that's a long, sustained success, they build it through the draft. Uh, so you do have your your really big years with the Jaguars where it pays off for them to spend that money. Uh, in 2017, it paid off for them. Uh, they won seven more games than they won the previous year, and they were the biggest spender in free agency in 2022. Uh, they won six more games than they won the previous year when they were 3-14 and 14 in 2021, and they made the playoffs. So – you're starting to see more immediate return on investment out of the free agency, big spenders. Like you got to be making it rain in the club. All right. Lots of straight cash, homie. And what happened, I, and my, my theory is that, and I, cause I pointed this out at the beginning. I now just have some, some more proof uh, after doing some research that lately uh, we've seen a shift as the salary cap has grown. You can be a big spender and see immediate returns, right? An immediate bump um, uh, with your win total. Um, but like I said, over a longer period of time, you got to make sure you're going to more responsible, frugal ways to acquire talent like the draft, undrafted free agents, and the trade market. Um, but since 2016, we have seen teams who are the biggest spenders in free agency have those bumps that I described, right? The immediate bump. In 2016, it was the New York Giants. Uh, and they won five more games than they won the previous year and made the playoffs. In 2017, it was the Jags. Talked about them. Won seven more games and made the playoffs uh, after being the biggest spender in free agency. 2018, Chicago Bears. They won seven more games than they won the previous year and made the playoffs. 2019, it was the Jets. They won three more games, no playoffs. Uh, Miami Dolphins in 2020. Five more games they won uh, than the previous year. They were the biggest spenders, but they did not make the playoffs. 2021, it was the New England Patriots, won three more games in the previous year, made the playoffs. 2022, Jags won six more games and made the playoffs as the biggest spenders in free agency. And the Denver Broncos in 2023 won three more games, but did not make the playoffs. So five of the eight teams, five of the last eight biggest spenders in free agency in the NFL have actually seen a bump and also made the playoffs. And I think it's because right around that 2016 uh, year, the salary cap saw an 8.3% increase um, in the salary cap. And it was the largest increase in 10 years. Uh, It was actually the largest cash increase also in 10 years, not just percentage of the salary cap increase. And I believe in 2006, they saw like a 19.3% increase, but I think that was like a a growth and adjustment from the the previous CBA. And they saw a $16.5 million bump. Remember this past season, we saw a $30 million bump. That was the biggest uh, increase in the history of the NFL in the salary cap in terms of the cash and in terms of the percentage. But in 2016, at the time, it was the uh, largest bump in 10 years. And and teams started to, I, I think they started... Uh, to reflect that in their spending in free agency, they started to spend more money, uh, overspend, some would say, but they started to spend more money in free agency and acquire more talent. And that's when I think we saw these, like I said, immediate returns for the biggest spenders in free agency. Um, but it, it's not a recipe and it's not going to work for everybody. These are just the guys at the top of the list. And there are examples of these t- teams having fluctuations 
in their win totals throughout the years. So if you want sustained success, that's something you do through the draft. But if you want that quick bump, I will say lately, if you make it rain enough, you do get that bump. You got to make it rain a lot, though. Yeah. A lot of straight cash only. Yeah. At least $200 million. No, you, you got to make it rain. And the reality is most teams don't need that. A lot of the teams don't need to yes. do These everything in there. Teams. You yeah. just have to. <laughs> You just got to spend some, though. You just can't be last in spending and spend nothing and then expect to get better. That's a lot harder to do. That is true. Yeah, you're right. Uh, neither of these teams, none of the teams are in the top six right now in free agency spending made the playoffs. Falcons, yeah. Titans, Panthers, Vikings, Commanders, Las Vegas Raiders. To your point, you got to, you know, you can you can go there and cherry pick, but you ain't got to rebuild the whole damn roster no. free agency. But some teams try to, to try to spend. They try to uh, spend to cover up dysfunction, and that's that's not the way to go. No, and, and, right, and uh, the Falcons yeah. fall into the well. We signed Kirk Cousins to a ridiculous deal, <laughs> and that deal is. And I'm like, I'm not I'm sad that they signed him, or they don't think it's bad that they signed him. But it's just a lot of money to give Kirk Cousins. A lot of money to give Kirk Cousins uh, for a guy who's just going to win the division, and everybody kind of understands he's not going to win the Super Bowl, but he will win the division. It's like, man, I could have got Sam Howell to win that down division uh anyway uh at a lot cheaper price are right, we come back we're here from stephen jones speaking of cheap billionaires we're here from stephen jones cat boy himself uh he'll talk about what the cowboys are doing in free agency and what their plan is going forward all that more right here on the 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 horn the the rodcast featuring my man patrick davis i'm lifetime long one rod Babers coming right back Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Uh, other than the traffic <laughs> that you just heard about, Austin is one of the best cities in the country. Uh, whether you're talking about the live music, which a lot of people will be enjoying doing South by Southwest, whether you're talking about the food, which is great, the people are fantastic, the weather is really cool, and I love the city itself. It's such a unique city, all the iconic landmarks around town, which you may not know uh, is that these iconic landmarks that we love so much that make this city so unique were actually a lot of them built and constructed by the hands the skilled craftsmanship of iron workers local union 482 uh, like pennybacker bridge and dkr stadium and as the city continues to grow and thrive well so does iron workers local 482 they don't go to the office they're the ones who actually build it so if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or you're looking for a refreshing career change maybe you want a, a new challenge in your life maybe you want to feel valued by your employers uh whatever the reason that you want to shift uh professions you can do it with iron workers local 482 they're hiring 3,000 people for a huge project right here in Central Texas as we speak. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. So become a member of Iron Workers Local 482 and take pride in the type of teamwork and craftsmanship that helps shape the future of our great city. Maximize your potential today and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself by applying online at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org.
Welcome back to the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. We call him the Idealionaire for a reason. He comes up with a lot of great ideas, one of them being 512 Friday, where Patrick plays uh, uh, songs and jams from bands and artists. Uh, some of them are very talented human beings, uh, but some of them you have the chance to catch live right here in the ATX and let you know exactly how you can do that. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Hannah Barricat. She's playing part of a hard rock showcase of all local bands Saturday at come and take it live. Oh, I know where that is. Uh, I'm cool enough to know where that is. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm in Patrick. Uh, we had some, some times, some good times over there. Yeah. Right, had some day. parties so thrown over that. there. Good friends of mine um, over there. Yeah. You got good people, man. Patrick knows a lot of people around, around town. I'll say that. Um, cause he's a well-known guy because he's a Renaissance man. It was funny. Times, so it was funny yesterday that. walking around out at auditorium shores and just kept running into people from different points in my life and different. They just see it. And I was standing with a buddy of mine. He's like, man, you, you know, too many people here. No, like, too yeah. many people, man. Yeah. You've, you've lived like multiple, you live like so many different lives already. Yeah. And, and <laughs> shout out, I mean? shout out to my buddy, Chris Allen, who uh, I was talking to yesterday and said, he listens to us in the shower and I told him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, you know what? I do appreciate him listening to us in the shower, but yeah, you should stop. You should stop. He plays in a band called yeah. dead love club. If you want to check him out, they do a lot of 80 stuff. So he, he's a cool guy. Cool, but yes, love he was that. like, I listen to you in the morning, man. <laughs> Loving the show. Uh, but I listen to you. It's kind of weird. I listen to you. And then when I'm getting ready in the shower, I'm like, you gotta stop doing that, man. It's weird. You gotta stop doing that. That is, yeah, that is strange. You gotta tell you that is not a compliment. It, it is a compliment, but it doesn't feel like one for some reason. Uh, there you go. So my man, Patrick, always hitting us up on the five, one, two Friday. All right, let's uh, hear from Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones actually was at South by Southwest. And he had a panel discussion that he was involved in. So I'm not sure if this is at South by Southwest, but it might be. Um, and kind of listen to some of the stuff in the background and, and maybe it hints it, there's some clues in it that maybe he's still uh, at South by Southwest when these uh, these clips come out. But either way, Stephen Jones was talking about uh, free agency. He was talking about the Cowboys and, and their all in philosophy, or at least the comments that were made by Jerry Jones. Uh, let's hear first from him discussing the frustration that fans have after the Jerry Jones quote about being all in went viral um, and how that really is the antithesis of what the Cowboys free agency philosophy actually is. Here is Stephen Jones. I mean, that's everybody certainly has that right. I mean, we, uh, you know, I know where the frustration is the fact that we haven't uh, had success in the playoffs uh, to their satisfaction until we do that. then uh, you know, the criticism uh, is certainly, uh, uh, something that's going to be there. And we know that's going to be there, but uh, we're going to stick with what we believe will ultimately uh, get us a championship uh, here for our fans. But, uh, uh, you know, we don't define all in as what you sp uh, spend in free agency. It's keeping, you know, the core, keeping some of the great players in this league, like Dak Prescott, like uh, C.D. Lamb, like Micah Parsons, like Diggs. Uh, you know, that's what we define as all in. As so y'all fell for it. Basically, y'all was being gaslit, Cowboys fans. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Jerry and Steven always gaslighting y'all, man. And that's 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 the sad part. They gaslight y'all, y'all get all crazy and wild, <laughs> and then they come over to we know all in for us is just re-signing the really good players that we already have. We like our guys. You're like, you know that's not what people meant with all in. Why would you say that? <laughs> what are y'all doing to these cowboys fans? Boy, to, to us, all in means the expectation. <laughs> just the <laughs> basic expectation. That's like that's like going to your job every day, working just the amount you're supposed to work, and then be like, man, I am going. I am this job I take seriously. I work 24 <laughs> hours a day, seven days a week. Like, man, you clocked out, clocked out five you minutes just, early. No, nah, but, but that's 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 all in, man. That's all in. I agree with you, man. They cow they they play mind games with Cowboys fans, and it's funny. Uh the next clip is Stephen Jones talking about their philosophy and free agency like how they're going to approach free agency because cowboys fans want to know well if you're not all in then what the hell are we doing in free agency can you can you at least give me the plan uh, for a free agency here is steven jones i don't look at it as uh, the next few weeks i look at it as you know all the way up and up and through the season in terms of uh you know how we continue to address this and you know, just as we all see that first day, uh, first negotiating day, uh, you know, it's, it's wild and it's and it's big, big, big dollars. And uh, uh, but then uh, as you see now, things are calming down and, uh, you know, that's where we think, uh, you know, you can be efficient and, and do do good things. I think we have in the past, whether it's via trade or whether it's via just a, 
uh, like we did yesterday with uh, Kendricks. I'm sure there'll be more players released around the league uh, as people move forward and uh, work with, within their cap. So you never know what you might see that you don't see today. So uh, those are all things that we feel very prepared uh, to make quick decisions on and uh, I look forward to it. Now, they did resign uh, Jordan Lewis to a one-year deal. That was good. Um, but we also heard, Patrick, the audio of Derrick Henry uh, going on Mad Dog Sports Radio and saying, yeah, the Cowboys never reached out to me. It never reached out to my people. Now, maybe they couldn't afford them. Um, but in terms of due diligence, it's a little surprising, I guess, disappointing that the Cowboys wouldn't at least, you know, a guy who lives there right in the offseason, yeah. they wouldn't reach out to see if he would be interested. Yeah, a guy that you know your fan base like just just so you can go to your fan base and go, we we called, he wanted ten. We you know what do you want us to do? Like we do you want us to cut three players? Do you want us to do like we can't? So when we do this, this means nothing else. But but if you just say no, we figured, it's not it's not a good <laughs> enough example. Like this is no. your one job. This is what you're supposed to do is run this franchise. And if you can't handle that, you have too many other responsibilities. I have a noble idea. I don't know a novel idea. I don't know if, if the Cowboys fans will go with me. Hire a real GM. If you can't handle it, you can't make the phone calls. Hire a GM. Maybe. Never. Never happen. No, I'm aware it's never not going to happen. happen. <laughs> I'm aware it's not going to happen. Maybe when, you know, his time has come and Jerry Jones is no longer the owner and the GM, and that will only come when he's no longer on this earth, then that day will come. But Jerry Jones, and you're, but you're right, though, because look what, look what the, te the Texans were at dumpster fire and a fuster cluck. Yeah. Like three years ago, they hired the right GM, Nick Casario, and he's made the right moves in order to put them in a position to have a, a championship window, which they right now are in the second year of. So it does matter. He also was asked about running back. Uh, he said they're basically, I'm paraphrasing, they're waiting on the market to present them with an opportunity yeah. that they can pounce on a running back. Ho hope is not a strategy, but the Cowboys do a lot of hoping. They sure I don't hope, do. Hope this they works sure out. sure do. I think he what knew he hell? couldn't say we're going to draft one and people would be okay with it. I think that's what he really knew, too. He's like, hey, Gango, yeah. we'll draft one. You're like, are you going to draft another Deuce Vaughn? We all like <laughs> Deuce Vaughn, but he ain't the answer. <laughs> he ain't the answer. Yeah, he's like, where are you going to draft him? It's the question. You're like, you're going to draft one? He's like, well, if you don't draft one in the first four or five rounds, then. If you don't draft you one know. in the second, by the second round, to be your starting running back, and the only running back on your roster that we trust to hand the ball to 25, like, yeah, you can't wait till the third and miss. No. Yeah. And this is a weak running back draft. Yeah. As we all That's what I'm saying. And if, if three go, where are you going? I agree. If you get, right now, if, I don't know what the hell they do. You, you draft Jonathan Dillon Brooks, right what are you going to do? Cause you don't have a running okay. back for the beginning of the season. And AJ <laughs> Dillon reportedly is leaning toward going back with the Packers. And I, I believe he's already signed with them. I believe he, he, yeah, I believe okay. he is going back to Packers on a so, four-year qualifying deal or something like that. Yeah, something a, like that. Okay. Well, so that's off the table. I don't know what the hell they do at running back. This is crazy. This yeah. is it. I mean, I hope they do actually have a play in the strategy because right now I cannot, I can't see it. I can't see it. I don't know what the strategy would be uh, out of all the possible. It can't be the draft because that's irresponsible. If you're just saying now it's got to be draft. And I think trading for Damian Pierce would be a, a nice option yeah. for him. I guess they're just waiting on running gas, running backs to get cut. After I mean, like, cap, I, you also, go with, that, that's a hope strategy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, you got, you're OK with going to Alexander Madison, who wasn't good enough to do it in Minnesota and hope that he works. Come on, man. Like, that's yeah, really where we, that's where we're at in the running back market now, though. I mean, you could go out and get Deontay Foreman, but Deontay Foreman was going to be a really good back for you when you had Tony Pollard. Because you yeah. have the two back system and it works in stable. If you're saying we're going to get one back. That's our guy, and then we're going to hopefully draft a running back, but maybe we'll miss because we want to get one in for a value. We need value, so we're going to try in the fourth and fifth round and get somebody, and if we miss on that, then we have one running back on our roster, and then maybe we'll re-sign Rico Doddle. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah, just not... It's it just it, it really is. It's a nonsensical strategy, whatever their uh their strategy is, which I can't really figure out. Uh, all right, we come back. We'll wrap it up, put it in the oven. We'll play Who Said That? We'll little piece of audio and tell you why. Uh, Freak Flag Friday is just not as freaky as it used to be. All of that and more, we'll wrap it up and let you know uh, what's on tap. Uh, right here when we return on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Mike Tom Mohan. Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? I'm Tom Lohorn, Rod Babers. Let's talk about Dr. Yu, Dr. Greg Eckert, and his all-star team. Uh, he can uh, he can give you a brand new smile in one day. He can uh, handle any uh, serious dental issues like he did with me with my wisdom teeth. Uh, he can handle any general, general dentistry you need. Maybe it's something as uh, maybe it's something uh, really easy. Right? Maybe it's an easy fix. Maybe you just go in there for a teeth cleaning. Maybe uh, you just want to go for a checkup. He can handle that. But uh, if you have any serious issues uh, like uh, you know, dentures or porcelain crowns or, you know, veneers, dental implants, full mouth reconstruction, even root canal therapy. Dr. You, uh, Dr. Red Eckert is the perfect place for you. I owe him a debt of gratitude uh, because when I went there, I just went for a checkup, just went for an easy cleaning. Uh, turns out after doing a little bit of uh, x-rays and, and the coach and the, and the, and the doctor doing some you know, a little bit of diagnosis. They figured out that my wisdom teeth were going in sideways, had to get that fixed before it became a dire situation. Um, and they got it fixed. Uh, actually uh, informed me and uh, educated me about the entire process, made sure that I was uh, I was comfortable and it was a stress-free process for me. Uh, all the dental anxiety that I might have had, they put me at ease. Uh, and now I got to tell you, I got to go back to Dr. Yu just to make sure everything is being handled. But I owe them a huge debt of gratitude for what they did for me. And they can do for you as well. Dr. Yu is always on the cutting edge of the technological advances in general dentistry. And right now he has the ability to give you a brand new smile in just one day. Permanently secure to your dental implants. No time spent without teeth. You'll get temporary fixtures until they can complete your permanent smile and you'll smile again with confidence and eat freely without pain or discomfort. So if you've been told your teeth need to be replaced, just call Dr. Yu and learn about this revolutionary alternative to dentures. You got nothing to lose but everything to gain because it's a complimentary consultation. 512-345-3166. That's 512-345-3166 or visit DrEckert.com, D-R-U-E-C-K-E-R-T.com.
Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a 512 Friday. That's when Patrick plays jams from local bands and artists that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Brian Scartoci. He's playing uh, Saturday at the Skylark Lounge. You want to hear some old school soul music then? I like that. Yeah. This very sounds very soulful. Yeah, very like soulful that. stuff. Um, okay, uh, thanks to my man Patrick for 512 Friday, brother. You always do a great job, and we appreciate that. It's time for a Who Said That when we play some audio, and then uh, basically you guys out, out there got to guess who said that and what they're talking about. Uh, Patrick got some audio for us for Who Said That. All right, so this is going to be a, an interviewer asking a question and then the person responding, but we'll see who said that. Yeah. So while everybody else is, the other new free agents are looking at houses and apartments <laughs> probably a unique experience for you right now <laughs> yeah i do know the area good and i don't think i'll be staying with my parents so <laughs> 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 maybe we'll see um but yeah my mom's coming to pick me up in about 30 minutes so <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of nice when your mom can pick you up from work so <laughs> oh I, the, the, who said it that? sounds familiar though who is that that does sound familiar and the story sounds familiar too who is that? That Who's is that? Uh, that is Mac Jones talking about going back wow. to Jacksonville, where he is from. His parents still live. Great point. And so yes. he was asked uh, about people trying to find a new home after you get traded, and he was like, "Yeah, I know the area. <laughs> I that grew is, up there." Man, I knew I recognized the voice. There you go. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he had went to school in Jacksonville. Either. Yeah, born in there Jacksonville, raised in Jacksonville, and back in Jacksonville. So he seems happier for a guy who on the Patriots never really seemed to be happy. This no, he seems seem to he seems happy. to be laughing and smiling in Jacksonville. So uh, if there's something out of it, he maybe he's a wow. little bit happier there. There you go. Hey man, the quality of life matters sometimes. I and mean, sometimes you think uh, I'm sure you want to follow Tom Brady with the Patriots and everybody hyped him up. But sometimes, man, it's about your uh, your quality of life, and uh, you can't put a price on that, man. Can't quantify it. Uh, okay, real quick, uh, we didn't talk about this at all, but it may put a damper on some people's weekends. Pornhub. <laughs> Pornhub has blocked access to the state of Texas. Um, yeah, some por pornography companies, including Pornhub, recently failed in their attempt to block a new Texas law from going into effect. On Thursday, Pornhub completely disabled the website access for users in the state of Texas to comply with HB 1181. So some of y'all are going to be very, very disappointed when y'all get home. <laughs> You probably already know about it, some of y'all. Uh, anyway, uh, we hope you have a great weekend in spite of that. Thank you, Patrick, for everything you do, brother. You are the man. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. We're talking about it right here on the broadcast. Everybody have a great weekend. Be safe. We love you, and we mean that. Peace.